Welcome to the show, everyone. I think we're in. Let's have a look and see if YouTube catches up. I was just catching up on some Six Nations rugby, and I missed the time by a bit. It's crazy how time goes. All of a sudden, you have an hour left before the show starts. The second you check the watch again, it's five minutes, and all of a sudden, you know, everything begins. So I'm saying hi to everyone in the chat. Justin Bailey, Paul, Watch Lounge, Curtis, welcome, Neville, Sanford, Chung, Tippy, Tom Austin, Chili Badger. Welcome, everyone. Great to have you here. I uh, just want to make sure, can you hear me okay? Um, comment one in the chat if you can hear everything fine. And we can chat about leisure watches, which should be quite cool. Interesting show. Last week was quite a grind. So this week, I hope to tone it down a little bit and uh, keep it a bit simpler. Carlos, hello from Panama. Welcome. Okay, great. You can hear me. Superb. Jenks from Wales. Yeah, I've just been catching up with the rugby. Not such a good start to the Six Nations. I think these teams are they're not very well formed. You know, they don't seem to have much synergy. Anyway, we can talk about rugby, I guess. Uh, Founder Timeless Capital, welcome. Antonio, Clive, great to have you. Superb. Chi Town, thank you so much for the super chat, brother. Always good having you here. You're wearing your Zodiac Super Seawolf. That is so cool. So we can chat about leisure watches. I think last week was about stealth. This week can be about comfort, leather, leisure, weekend, the kind of watch that you wear when um, you want to be quite discreet. You don't necessarily want to think about what watches you're wearing. It should be quite cool. I've, I've Once again, I've created a, a sort of checklist that we can follow and use to help define. But as always, with the start of every stream, as this year has began, we have the live five. So I just want to say hi to everyone else as I start with some water. I'm hitting the Shiraz tonight. It seems pretty good, quite fresh. Okay, Ryan, Bud Owens, welcome. Fahim, great to have you here, brother. Nice to have you. Uh, Watch Lounge, Radon, Quintel. Is there so many names? Quinton, sorry. There's so many names going on. Uh, more David B, welcome. Awesome, great to have you. It's already 45 of you here. I don't know what the stream's going to be like tonight. We're going to keep it very mellow and laid back. Last week was a grinder, to say the least. Uh, I didn't really define the, the subject well enough and paid for it dearly. We went through so many references, and uh, yeah, it's nice to just back off a little bit and turn it down. So, Jazzy Ninja, it's cool to have you here. Made a live show. Yeah, awesome. There's always someone new joining, and uh, I really enjoy it. As always, if you'd like to get me more directly, um, tag me at IDGuy in the chat or hashtag IDGuy. That also works. It's a little bit easier uh, for me to see what's going on in the comments. Oh, superb. Second hour watches, Manuel, Orange Hand. Always great to have you here, Orange Hand. Love your love your name and your avatar and everything. Okay, so beginning with the live five, what do we have from left to right? Generally, the live five are a series of watches that I found over the week that had some kind of impact on me in a way. Uh, and some of these are going to have their own videos prepared. It's been a great week. Well, I can tell you, um, the next the next few weeks, there's some good videos coming. Lots of variety and diversity for a change. So it should be a lot of fun. We're getting into the watches on the screen. From left to right, we have a Seamaster Aquaterra. And what I always mess up, let me just pull up the references. So if you are in the chat now, or if you are re-watching the stream later on uh, in the week or whatever else, in the chat right now, I will link to all the watches that you are seeing. So I'm just checking, I'm just checking if the spelling is right with everything. Uh, I think it is good enough. So there we go. They're all the references from left to right. So if you're keen on looking at the references in more detail, we can get that sorted out. And there's so many more names. Uh, Junior Johnson, welcome. Uh, Mirinel, welcome. I hope I got your name right. Mirinel. Um, let's see who else. So many. I can't keep up. The, the chat just goes mad. Reed, welcome. Great to have you. Uh, you see a Whiskey Town Racer, Ryan, Tippy, welcome. Jeez, okay. So let's just run through these watches first, and then we can get to the chats in a bit more detail and start talking about leisure watches. These don't necessarily have much uh, relationship to the theme of the stream tonight, uh, but the, th the thinking is always to just, you know, keep the variety. David Williams, great to have you here. Christopher, superb. And I see Matthew from New Zealand. You guys are just so committed. It's amazing. Thank you all for joining. It's such a pleasure having you here. And Amin, thank you so much for the super chat. So great. You guys are superb. 
So from left to right, Seamaster Aquaterra. Got some nice orange highlights. I think these watches are very, very underrated. And uh, just for what you're getting, the amount of money you're paying and what you get as a result. This is a superb looking watch. Love the finish, the details, the symmetry. Um, I did say when talking about the Aquaterra that that symmetry can be a bit of a problem at times because you can't really divide your eye up on the areas on the dial. Uh, you need something to help break up the lines. And with that symmetry of all the batons looking the same, it can be quite difficult to read the time. You notice that the hands and the batons are almost identical. And in that way, it can be difficult to read the time at a glance. So that's why it's better to always have something at the 12 or at least something to help center you, whether that's a thicker triangle, whether that's a plot or whatever else. But it is a really cool watch. Uh, I think they managed to get the size right. They've managed to make it sporty, but also dressy. It does have quite a good relationship with leisure watches as we get into the show. And then this piece has really caught my attention. It's a fascinating watch. So it's a titanium, Breguet reference 5517. And uh, <laughs> let's see, I just, I'm gonna try and keep up with the chats and keep you guys in the loop. Fridge, welcome, cool name. <laughs> Uh, Flip and Zipper, awesome to have you here. Who reads the time on their fancy watch? Exactly. So this reference 5517, uh, I'm going to be making a video next week about it. It's very interesting. Um, what I've said often about Breguet is that they really know how to celebrate their design language, their own way. And what they've managed to do here so well is that they can pretty much extrapolate what they've done with their classic line. And make it modern in a sense. And I'm sure most of you know that Breguet was really, they're known for being watchmakers for very influential people like Napoleon, uh, Duke of Wellington. But then where they really got their claim to fame internationally was their marine chronometers. So using that, and, and marine chronometers, basically a very accurate reference time that was used on ships as they were traveling to and from the world. And uh, it's, it's amazing to and from the world sorry, from different continents. You know, you need a good reference time. You need something that is extremely, extremely accurate. So incorporating that whole story into your narrative with coming up with a, a watch design, really cool. I'm gonna, I've, I've opened up a separate tab on this watch so we can look at it in a second. Then we've got the Patek Philippe Aquanaut travel time. And for the life of me, I can never get the reference right. So let me just pull up, it's, it's the reference 5164A. And it's really cool. Um, I, going back to the stealth watches that we talked about last week, this is another brilliant stealth watch, very low key, understated. Um, like the use of the hands, like the, the way the pushes have been integrated to the sides, very similar to the Nautilus travel time. All of these pieces need to be um, discussed at length in the future. Okay, and I just wanna catch up. The chat is just going mad. I'm sure you guys are chatting amongst yourselves. Rhodium rules, Flip and Zipper says, yeah. Uh, it's a really cool piece. I want to get into it now. Uh, Carlos talking about there's a conversation going on. Um, <laughs> drop and give me a Ving T. It's funny, Clive. Uh, yeah, should be cool. Well, GS released a ton of new models this week, Tom Austin says. We can have a look at those. That'll be cool. Uh, the wristwatch experience. Welcome. Thank you for joining. So, carrying on with this, I really dig this model. So, this is a reissue of the Omega Speedmaster Mark II. I'm working on a write up on this watch next week that will come out the week after. And the Mark II has an awesome story behind it. Essentially, they, they took elements of the Alaska project and incorporated it into their late 60s, early 70s references. Omega wanted to give this line a bit of a facelift and the, the color scheme and the racing dial is just quintessential 70s. And it is really one of those pieces that captures that time period so well. I, I really like the streamlined case. I think that is what's polarized most people is that the casing hasn't aged necessarily as well as what we see with most other pieces. But in the write-up about this watch, it's about two thirds finished. I, I give an argument and a counter argument to why this layout is so good, the, the, the case design and everything else. It makes it very instrumental, um, much more streamlined nowhere near as complicated visually, which adds a lot of emphasis to the dial. And then we see the highlights and the use of the racing track. And so this is a reissue. They are quite expensive nowadays, but um, I think it also it uses a, a modified 861 caliber. I don't know the exact specifics, but it's cool. 
like the highlights. Uh, don't know so much if this, if you want a Mark II, I don't know if this is the epitome of the Mark II. It's unique, but um, the the older version, the original, you know, Speedmaster dial is a bit more true to form. So, you know, it's all up to personal preference, but I think it's very interesting. Just the case design and everything, nice and streamlined, it's cool. And then we have the Longines Heritage Classic. And this watch, I need to make a video about it. I've been waiting long enough, but it does deserve a, a discussion. Because it really is something cool. It, it piqued my interest a lot as the year came to a close last year. And it has to be one of the most beautiful sector dials money can buy you nowadays. Speaking of which, next week, Tuesday, um, I'll be putting out a video on the JLC sector series, looking at all the references, the three pieces in that family. But this really does look stunning. Uh, 39 mils, a little bit oversized for, um, you know, the, the average wrist. But at the same time, the way they've balanced out the proportions and the spacing on the dial, the use of heat blued elements, the, the contrasting colors, the metal finishes, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, okay, need to catch up with all of you guys. I've said my piece. This has been a good, I really love these live five sessions because it gets me into the zone. I mean, I was watching rugby not, what, three minutes, 10 minutes ago. It's already been 10 minutes into the show. And this gets me woken up. I begin talking about watches a bit more. So, uh, Founder Times Capital says, love, love the casing on the Amiga. It is something very interesting, but I think it's also the element that has polarized most who are interested in the family. Um, you know, it's crazy how close they were to getting this case published and created and used by NASA in a bigger extent. It's a really cool history. Um, when we go into the history of the Alaska project, there's lots of little things. They took elements of the original Alaska project case, blended it together, and put it in the Speedmaster Mark II. They used those elements. Uh, let's have a look at everything else. Weekday hustle. Welcome. Less to love the watches. I see a super chat from Steve. Steve, thank you so much for the for the super chat. I uh, meant to ask last time you were live, the vintage-looking chrono you have, I would like to buy as a daily user. Can you name the brand, please? The vintage-looking chrono. Um, I would imagine it's probably the, oh, geez, I have a few. The Corniche Heritage, that might be one of them. It was a Corniche chronograph that I was wearing the other week. Um, send me an email if you like. It's on the About page, on the About section of my channel, at ID Guy. Um, you should be able to find it. Uh, let's see, I need to catch up with everyone. Lester, Ryan, Subdial runs a little too close to the center stem, second hour watches. And you're talking about this Longines, this Longines piece. It's interesting how they, um, they scaled everything. I think you're talking about the Longines. <laughs> you know, it's, it's difficult to talk and keep up, but we'll see. Um, I'm being asked, where did I study industrial design? I studied industrial design in Cape Town for two years and in Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire, for two years. It was really cool. It was nice getting that blend of South Africa and UK education. Very different. Uh, it was a nice, nice defining experience. Weekend watch needs to be less formal, more sporty, Phil says. Okay, as we finish with the live five, so we will jump to a few defined bits and pieces of what I've just put a list together like last week. Um, should the Elango Odysseus get a rubber strap? Chi Town asks. I've chatted about that before. We can pull that watch up now, actually. It's a good idea. Um, okay. So that's, that's cool. I think we've sort of covered up the chat. I hope I managed to catch up with you guys. I don't know how delayed the stream is. I'm trying to like refresh the stream as we go. Let me pull up what I'm wearing and then, I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. Everyone knows what I'm wearing at this point in time. Um, let's see, Cheetown, how about a Vacheron Overseas Blue Dial? Bracelet for the week, yeah, yeah, very good for the week and then a rubber strap for the weekend. So this is what I'm wearing, I mean just, uh, get through the details, Clam Walker, thank you. Um, right, the Smith's Everest. Now I am going to be doing a write-up on this watch. Let's get a good full view picture of it. I've done a few minor apologies for the mess of the desk. Let's see, what's a good picture to use? I think that'll be pretty good. No, I don't like that, that's okay. You get to see the watch in quite a lot of detail. I've chatted about this watch to death. I have worn this for about five months now at this point in time. And in linking with the, the whole idea of a leisure watch, I, I say in this description, as we get to it just now, that it's a watch you put on when you don't want to think about watches. 
It's the kind of thing that you put on that you know you're wearing it, but it's nothing that necessarily draws your attention back to it all the time. It's something there, but it's out of the way. It's not an Erica's Originals Marine National, Eric. It's actually just a generic, found it on eBay. The way you can tell is the stitching is not as refined. Uh, it's it, The stitching should be a lot more tighter and this line shouldn't be jagged. It's, it's a pretty good strap. Um, I'm not, I don't know. I've been experimenting with the elastic strap and it's not as good as I would have liked it, but it's cool. It's nice to just experiment, play around with different finishes. So I've done a few modifications with this watch. I, I love adding my own little um, element, whatever influence to the piece. And I was able to find some really cool custom end links. And let's see if we can get a closer picture. A faux rivet bracelet, but these end links and everything else really ties the piece together. This is not how the watch originally came. But I will say that after wearing this piece for five years, five months, sorry, um, I think it's a must for anyone in this hobby. Just the level of fun you get out of this thing. You wear it, no one knows what it is. Even if you don't know that it replicas a, a Rolex 1016 Explorer, there's just something so cool about the piece. And just for information's sake, for all of you who might be keen on the watch, I've never actually put the reference in, but here is the reference I'm dropping into the chat again for you. It's Smith's Everest 36 mil PRS 25. That's the, uh, the code. I got the second hand. It really wasn't expensive. I think it, it sits in the ball ballpark of about... Um, 300 pounds, roughly, but it's so cool. And I mean, a couple of guys have seen it. I see Fahim, yeah, he's he's seen this watch in the flesh. It's really slick. Like you just, you don't need to worry about it. It's got a sapphire crystal, bit of AR coating, Miyota 9015. These photos make the watches look so big on the wrist. The thing is with the, with the way the end links have been arranged, the watch looks a lot bigger. It kind of rounds it off nicely, but it's superb. I really enjoy it and I won't be dragging on this point too much but i highly recommend you if you can find one of these second hand on ebay uh find a aftermarket strap for it possibly i don't know the the original strap isn't the best the bracelet um but it's just so light easy to wear again it's the watch that you wear when you don't want to think about what you're wearing and uh it's amazing it has such a nice appeal i find myself gravitating towards it all the time which is quite seldom you know i can be just sitting and thinking okay i need to put a watch on throw it on, not think about it. And there really is this explorer um, draw that has, it's, it's like a parabola. In the beginning, you think, yeah, it's just a simple dial. I probably won't enjoy it. But as you get into it and you just wear it, you realize just how useful it is and how basic but effective it is as an everyday wearer. Oh, that's so cool. I've missed a lot of your chats. Should a leisure weekend watch have a date or no date? We'll talk about that now. Very good question. And it really is up to, it's very um, open-ended. The, the question about these pieces, very, uh, very open. Whether it should be complicated, whether it should be simple, it's down to you. And we can talk about that now as I open the page. So I want to do a write-up on this piece very soon and just cover the, the five-month wearing experience. I really enjoy it so much. And as we do this, let me pull up a photo. Oh, geez, I love this. I want to talk a bit more about the 5517, and I hope you're seeing this okay, but I've made a very impromptu list. Again, this happened about five minutes before the stream, so uh, apologies if there's spelling mistakes and everything else. I don't even know if I got, did I, I think I spelled everything okay. So what does the leisure watch defined as? Difficult to, it's difficult to hammer home. It is actually more difficult to summarize than something like a, a stealth watch, quote unquote. And I see so many details tagging me in the chat. G-Shock Neo Tokyo. Let's pull that up just now. Um, Blanc Pump Bathyscaf. I don't hate it, VS. I think the, oh, the, oh, geez. No, I was thinking about the 50 Fathoms. Yeah, the Bathyscaf, I've got a weird, just this weird emotion behind it. Uh, it's, it's the proportions that get me. It's the size of the indices. I think the chronograph is a little bit tighter. We can talk about that now. Uh, I see Nippon Man, welcome. Second hour watches. There's a couple of, James Con. Great to have you here. I've, I've hardly shouted out any of your names. Patek Philippe 5712. That's a banger. Really cool piece. My opinions on the Tudor Black Bay 36. I've got it open in a tag, so you'll see that right now. Okay. What does a leisure watch define as? This first section is pretty open to interpretation. You can choose whether or not you agree with it. Uh, less about function. Uh, does it need to have a complication? 
don't know so much. What about the size? Is it medium? Is it small in size? Should it be compact? Precious metals, possibly. So you can go both ways. You can either say a leisure watch is something that you wear um, just for its simplicity and that you want it out of the way. Or on the flip side, do you want it to be extremely complicated and something that only you can enjoy? All up to interpretation. The, the, the use of the straps, do you want it to be on a leather, rubber, nylon? I think you can be a bit more lenient with what kind of strap you want with it over the course of a weekend. Um, should it be simple? Don't know. But I think the best part, we highlight this, when, when, sorry, wear it when. That's very bad. So you wear it when you don't want to think about watches. I think that's quite important. Uh, you wear it when it doesn't necessarily need to attract attention. It's something you keep out of the way and you just throw on and use on over the course of the weekend. And then adding an extra definition, wear it when you, you want to keep it out of the way. So those are a few little bits and pieces that I think are quite important with the whole leisure, leisure watch idea. I'm never going to get that name right. Leisure, chill, whatever you want to say. Weekend, chill, wearing watch. I don't know. Okay, so the 5517, it's a watch that's really caught my attention, and I know it's it's divided opinion in the community because it's strange. And primarily, I think it's down to that idea of blending the dress and sports quite literally. This looks more like a dress watch than a sports watch. But the way Brega has used their DNA from their family in these pieces, it's amazing. I really like the idea that they've kept that classique-esque aesthetic but have managed to somehow carve it out of rock and make it into a sports watch. So it's really cool. I see lots of suggestions about pieces like the Hoyer Caliber 18 Chrono. One Hoyer, the, the Jack Hoyer edition, really got me into watches, actually. I want to talk about that now. It depends on how you're feeling. Yeah, as Founder Timeless Capital says, it really is dependent on you and what watch you find most appealing for the weekend. Uh, do you want a guilty pleasure watch, something that you're just throwing on for fun, like a G-Shock? Does it need to be serious at all? Um, but then on the other side, do you just want to go nuts and wear a five-digit watch? So there's a couple of pieces I've pulled together. Nothing, nothing too strong and hard or direct, but it's a cool discussion to have. I think there isn't there much talk about leisure wearing. So I don't know. It's just a, it's just a topic that came to mind yesterday. I, was, I generally always procrastinate and think about the idea a day before the show. But uh, yeah, it's like, let's see what else is going on. I see lots of lots of little comments like, what about colorful watches for fun from Sandford? Absolutely. This piece with its rhodium finish, if I'm not wrong. I think the one element that really draws me to this piece is the way that they've incorporated the Roman numerals into the dial. And I just love the cleanliness, the simplicity. Let's find a wrist shot of this piece. It's, it measures 40 mils. And it looks tiny, right? It looks minuscule. And that's down to the lugs. Very classic in the way they've arranged the lugs. Straight up, down, um, integrated bracelet. I don't know if that was their best call. But it's really interesting, right? You, you just tell from a distance. I think this is the, the real underlying detail is that when you look at this watch, you know it's a breguet without even being told. And it's, it's down to that element. They've been able to capture the character of the watch so well in this reference. Really cool. And titanium as well. This whole watch is titanium. It's a really expensive piece. Of course, it's got a crazy movement. It's just a simple date complication, but I think the, the DNA in this watch is what's really kept me going. Another thing I should highlight is that, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll carry on. It's not small. It's perfect. Truth fears. It does look good, right? Um, for for Breguet especially. Breguet is um, supposed to be a little bit understated and simple. How about Grails? AP Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar, Travis says. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> He's talking about simplicity and, and complex. Um, weekend Leisure Watch is a Yacht Master with a Rhodium. That's awesome, bud. I'm going to pull that up. I've really taken interest in the Yacht Master line. I find it quite a fascinating piece. Um, this lug's on my favorite, Tom Orson says. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's polarizing. It is quintessential Breguet in the way they've done it. But again, it's, it's the classic styling that some people really don't find interesting. Okay. So, I'm going to keep going. Black Bear 36, someone asked my opinion on it. It's an awesome beginner's watch, right? It's really, really cool. The only elements that I don't like so much, 
And I hope you guys can see the screen okay. I don't want to, uh, I hate getting the white section on the side. Let's see if I can pull it in a bit tighter. Oh dear. The second I try and manipulate the screen, so there we go, that's better. Black Bay 36, entry level, great size. Um, but it's that it's the hands and the dial that clash that I'm not so much of a fan of. I think if you use snowflake hands, you should attempt to use a snowflake dial. It divides opinion both ways. Some people really like this and don't like the snowflake dial. Others really like the alternative. So anyway, it's cool. I like the fact that Tudor uses their own motif with the snowflake hand, but they are overdoing it, you know. They're getting a little bit excessive with it. Using it on a chronograph, for example, I think is kind of unnecessary. So, uh, it's cool. Uh, I see MSRP from James saying MSRP about 17 to 19K. They're, they're expensive. You're talking about the Breguet. Yeah, it is, it's crazy. It is quite an expensive piece for what you're getting, but you know, it is a Breguet at the end of the day. I think it's, it's a nice sentiment. And I want to actually say, someone's mentioned in the last stream that this year, 2020, is going to be the year that I get my first luxury watch. And that's what I'm working towards. I'm going to delay the gratification. I have my eye on a piece. I'm 90% sure that I'm going to get it. And it's, it's brilliant. I think you'll all appreciate it and think it's a superb first choice for a watch. But I'm not going to disclose the name. Don't want to raise the hype or the attention to it, if possible. <laughs> and I want to delay the gratification until the end of the year which might be extremely difficult, but I'm really excited. So I want it to be a good reward for the end of this year to you know, celebrate where the channel's going and whether or not it, it improves. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Tudor Pelagos, Blue Cheetown says, we can pull that up, absolutely. So these are just some of the watches that I pulled up. Uh, Jean-Claude says, SMP. Seamass Professional is a great choice for a, just an everyday wearer. It's one of those watches that you can just pick up, throw on, use. <laughs> Founder Times Cavill says, do tell us. I want to keep it under wraps for a little while, at least. All I can say is that I think you will all appreciate it, whether you don't like the brand or not. Um, whether you do like it or not, shall I say. <laughs> the brown eye, Clive says. That's, it's such a classic, right? Um, I think you'll all find it to be a good choice. It's a watch that I've hyped up before. I've spoken about it. And it really epitomizes the brand, which is great. Excellent watchmaking, very good price. It's going to be cool. I look forward to really getting the, the watch out there one day. Anyway, so this Longines Big Eye, I thought it would be cool to bring up because we haven't chatted about it recently. It's one of those, <laughs> like I'm saying, just keep it going for two and a half miles. We can try. Um, last week, I really burnt myself out in the last, I would say the last half an hour or so because it was, I was going mad with references. So I'm going to try and, and uh, pull back a little bit, not look up so many references at once. It gets a bit taxing when you're following the chat and trying to create some kind of concise wording around the watches you're talking about. So we will get there. Uh, if you guys, and once again, if you can repeat your comments at later stages during the show, tag me at IDGuy. I can see it. It comes up in orange on my screen, so I see it very easily. And that way I can get to your watches. But I want this, talking about leisure watches, I want to keep it under key, low, subtle, not too all over the show, if possible. So I'm going to try and keep to the theme of, of simplicity, but of course, there's such, there's such a great variety of pieces to, to look at. Uh, Tom Austin says there's a new LEGS snowflake. I need to have a look at the Grand Seikos now. Apparently, a new line has been released or some new pieces have come out recently. So... Uh, Chitan says Longines has a very Breguet Type 20 dial look to it. And that's because the brands basically shared the same DNA through the 40s and 50s and 60s. Really cool history. Doing a write-up on the French military watches, all the watches of the Air Force and everything else. And it's crazy how much dial sharing there was back in the day. Anyway, that's another piece. I pulled up the Reverso. Oops, let's get that back. Now that I've shrunken the screen a little bit. Oh, dear. We'll get there eventually, warming up the mouse hand. The Reverso is also one of those pieces that you can just put on and forget about wearing. I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> Phil, Phil says, getting the Olive Dial OP. I don't know if that's me, that's you highlighting me, or if you're getting the watch. It's really cool. It's been a good week. Highlighted a lot of pieces. Uh, began the week with the reference 1142. 
no, was it? 114200, 34 mil Rolex pieces. Then we jumped to Patek and a series of split time chronographs, which is cool. End of the week, we looked at the Seiko Alpinist. It's going to be, it's a really, I like this blend. Uh, coming into next week, we're going to look at a bit more Rolex and then Longines and JLC, another Patek. I'm really, I'm really trying to throw out the, the subjects in different areas. Um, let's see. Uh, Neo says, a history of French military watches must include Dodane. Absolutely. Dodane is a very important brand. It's, it's right up there with Breguet and, uh, and Longines in the family. It's amazing. The thing is, it's so hard to find information. The archives are very small on the internet. So you have to really dig and sort of piece together what you can and try and make something worthwhile. I would say the write-up is about a third done, but it's just then all the editing that goes on behind the scenes. It'll have to happen. Thomas, as always, this guy is always here. It's such a pleasure having you here, Thomas. I sent you an email earlier. I hope you got it. Uh, here's a contribution from your viewers. Thank you so much. It's going to be cool. I uh, I really hope you enjoy the surprise, but I want to I want to keep it under the radar for the time being, um, at least for the next few months. I, again, it's delaying that gratification. I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a cool watch. Excellent first luxury watch. I think I've highlighted and touted it before, and my mouse is just frozen. Oh dear! Hold on a second. We'll get there. I pulled up the the Oyster Thirty Nine. Let's see. I pulled up the Oyster Perpetual 39 because I just thought it's it's a watch I, I saw a video on recently and I thought it would be nice to cover. The white dial especially really looks the business. And I uh, just love the simplicity, love that contrast between the two elements. And what's amazing about this dial in particular is that it manages to capture the light wherever it is in the room, whether you have a more warm light, so the dial will, will glow a, a creamy color, and once you get into an environment that has a more bright, uh, what would you say, cool light, like fluorescence, it'll shine bright white. And when you're in natural light, it goes like a pinkish hue, like a pearl. It's a really good finish. And uh, they've done a great job on this piece. Really enjoy it. Uh, let's see. Second hour watches. Thank you so much for the super chat, man. Really appreciate it. And uh, Tippy is asking about the, uh, the G-Shock Neo Tokyo. Okay. I'm going to get up now. Haven't haven't chatted about G-Shock at all. Shitan's saying that the OP39 is your grail watch. It is beautiful. It is quintessential Rolex. Whether or not the size appeals to you, that's open to debate. The uh, the color, the size, should I say the white, the white dial on this piece adds a lot more visual presence on the wrist. I would say it adds up to at least two mils more presence than what the size dictates. I think this watch would probably visually look like it wears like a 41 not so much a 39. Open to opinion, uh, depending on your wrist size. I have pretty average wrists for the most part. Look how much smaller this watch looks on the wrist all of a sudden. I'm pretty sure it's the same wrist. And just with a black dial, everything shrinks a bit more. The one advantage I think this watch has over the Explorer, actually, no, you can't really compare this piece to the, the modern Explorer Mark II, really. They are very different in their own way. But I think the one advantage that this watch has is the bezel. The fact that the bezel is rounded and not flat. Notice that it's domed. What that does, it manages to pull in everything. You notice around it, I don't know if I can zoom any more, but the coat and everything, the, the background, it looks like there's a picture frame. There's this convex nature that the bezel forms. And what it does is it, it tapers down the visual presence of the watch a lot. It actually makes it look a lot smaller than it visually is. Um, where the Explorer Two has a Explorer One has a flat bezel, um, so that's one element. But then you look at the dial; very typical Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Uh, doesn't have a safety clasp, but it is quintessential Rolex. It's one of those pieces that really you get to epitomize the brand of Rolex. Um, your one and done Rolex watch for sure, I would say. Okay, let's look at some references. I've missed out a couple of your chats asking for certain pieces. Uh, Lunga One was a suggestion, and I think that makes a superb piece for the end of the week. Um, Lunga, Leisure, I think it all goes in together. There's so many references within this line. It's actually very difficult to keep track. I found that uh, there was one reference about the day-date complication. The watch is completely reversed. Maybe I can find it. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, day. If I type in day, I'm sure I'll get something. Let's see. 
Yeah, we pulled it over here. So this is just a render. This isn't a, a photograph of the watch. But there's something really cool about the reverse dial on this piece. And simply what they've done is they've flipped it completely. But instead of having a power reserve on the left-hand side, you now have your day complication. So you have a day and date, which is a lot more practical. Don't know if that's very efficient for a weekend. But there's something about that balance on the dial that I really find attractive. Also that the pusher is on the left and it lines up in tandem with all the dates and the details. Really nice symmetry. I don't know, there's something about it. This, this offset styling seems a bit more coherent than the generic uh, style. Anyway, uh, let's have a look. I'm just talking about what everyone's drinking. I am uh, rocking a, what did I say? It's a Shiraz. Very nice Shiraz. Uh, Kumala. I think it's a South African, South African brand. Iced coffee, no sugar, Cheetown says. Good boy. Um, okay. It's great to have you all here. Again, I haven't said hi to half of you, but trying my best to keep up with the chats as well as everything else. Um, getting up on the YouTube ladder, Noel says. Teddy Bolas, I'm engineer and explorer. Teddy's a really cool guy. We've chatted often on Instagram. I'd love to meet him. Um, he did actually mention the other day, we were talking, I think he, he put a post out on the Explorer 2. And we were talking about us with smaller wrist sizes, how it's a watch. No, we were talking about pale skin. Us guys who have quite pale skin, how a white dial really makes us feel a lot more confident about what we're wearing, you know? Uh, I think it's true. A white dial on a watch, right, a white dial on a wrist that is pretty fair looks superb. Um, that was cool. Okay, so we're going to jump. Tom Austin saying the Hoya Caliber 18 Chrono. Let's have a look at that. And what I'll do is I'll pull up another piece. Let's get the JLC out the way. Still think the JLC Reverso is awesome. And you very seldom see this watch. It's going on a tangent. Very seldom see it on a bracelet. Who likes the beads of rice bracelet on these pieces? I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts. Um, one of my family friends actually wants to get a solid gold JLC Reverso when he retires and have it on a, on a mesh bracelet. It's really cool, right? I think it is. It's one of those enthusiast watches for sure okay just catching up with the suggestion so it's a hoya chrono 18. let's have a look now i need once again i need to cover hoya in more detail so i'm guessing this is a reissue of the carrera yeah caliber 18 and this was a very important caliber in the family back in the day uh you know hoya in the 60s is there a better picture or was this good enough i think it might be good enough hoya during the 60s was a, a serious pioneer they were known for, they were known to be the sports chronograph family. Uh, when brands like Rolex and Omega were still competing, Hoya was way above. They were on top in the game. Uh, all of their watches, I mean, you saw practically every racing car out there, whether it's European, uh, international. On the international circuit, you saw these watches featured everywhere. So the brand, should I say. And there aren't many good res images. Let's find something. So this champagne dial, <laughs> it's it's pretty it sums up that that period of time and again the uh, hoya is pretty good with their reissues they seem to enjoy it a lot so i'd be interested in knowing more about this caliber whether or not it uses the same uh, mechanics as the original i know most of us know that hoya chronographs from this era now are so sought after primarily because their movements were bulletproof you want a bulletproof watch movement and uh since these watches last a lifetime, it's really good. The movements are just as cool. Uh, okay, there's tags to me again. Let's see, drinking coffee, final time it says. Awesome. I finished my double. I always hit a double shot of coffee an hour before the show, and I'm, I'm on the ball. And then drink some alcohol to mellow me out. Works perfectly. Mont Blanc, Va Vasco, Vasco de Gama, dual time, Bud Owens says. Bud Owens, you were talking about another reference a second ago, and I missed it. Cheetown, I have a pale ivory complexion. White dolls work. Yeah, I agree. Um, tips on starting a YouTube watch channel, Giza says. Very, very good. Um, very good question. You know what? What I've learned, and I'm by no means an expert at this whatsoever. <laughs> uh, you really mustn't think that I'm an expert at this at all. I'm winging it, and the, the secret to anything in life is consistency. It really is. Uh, you need to find your niche and stick to it, whatever that is. I still probably haven't found my niche necessarily. Let's pull up this, this G-Shock near Tokyo. tippy has been asking for it a lot. Speaking of G-Shock, I um, need to 
Oh, that's cool. Uh, some high-res images, please. Let's see what we get. So Neo as in new or the one or, or neon or that's very cool. I like this is a really good marketing. I think that the color scheme, the landscape, cityscape is cool. So just uh, covering a YouTube channel, I'm going to pause the chat here and see if I can just reply to this question from Giza. Really great question. Um, so consistency is everything, as with anything in life. And you know, the way I started this channel was I said, how am I going to create content that everyone that I would like to see? I think that's more important than anything else. It's not so much catering to the next person. It is, if you had a watch channel, what would you like to see? And that's really where I've cemented it. I mean, I would get so boring if I stuck on a subject like Rolex, for example. I like talking about them. They, there's, there's lots of interesting thought pieces around the watches, but I by far not dedicate my time to just a brand like Rolex. There's so much more variety out there. And for example, Seiko. Seiko is not a brand that I really find appealing, but I know that a lot of people enjoy them. So I separate my thoughts and go into it uh, just thinking from a, a design front, what makes Seiko appealing? What makes this reference good? So on and so forth. And in the beginning, I was very biased to certain things. Um, I think being opinionated is good, but at the same time, you want to be halfway. I like riding the fence because you get you get poignant points across from either side, and it can be very good. Like I don't know, I, I'll talk about I'll talk about it as we go. But really good question, Giza. I could I could reply to that question for about half an hour, I'm sure. Um, so Forbin Class says you made me buy the Black Elpins today. It's a cool watch. I I really and I'll I'll say this again, talking about opinionated Hoya Joe Let's pull that up. Really really cool. I find a time this capital says I need more sun. You have no idea. Coming out of Africa. You no, know, I lived in Africa for what 21 years. You get three quarters of the year you're getting sunshine and swimming pools and the beach and uh you know you, you jump ship and you come to the uk things change very quickly having to supplement vitamin d and all of that stuff it's crazy um i love the hoya i think that the color scheme especially if you don't know the history behind the the josepher josepher was basically the the driver for the what was it 1970 le mans in the film and uh, this watch should have been steve mcqueen's watch in the film this is what his co-driver, Joseph uh, was using. And, you know, Hoya was just the business back in the day. Ortavia, rotating bezel, too, too cool. Okay. I've said a lot of things. Oh, talking about the Seiko Alpinist. I'm glad I can, like, address these chats. I'm sure I've missed a lot of you. I have a lot. Okay. Um, I'm not so much a fan of the, the, the old Alpinist with the green dial and the gold. I think that contrast is just... Strange, very, very strange. But uh, the new version, a little bit, it lines up a little bit more with the um, the aesthetic of a utility watch, but still keeps that dress DNA. That's the way I worded it in the in the video, at all in, for that reason. Let's have a look. So the Rhodium Dial Yachtmaster, a very unique watch, and there's a few pieces I really dig. This the the rose gold clash with the brown. I mean, imagine this bit, this this dial on the root beer sub on the root beer GMT. It would look superb, right? Absolutely stunning. It's not the best photo, but let's get through. So this rhodium piece. Now they they come in all sorts of different sizes. It's amazing. The yacht master is designed for basically anyone in the in the area, and there's still watches that you can get. They're still attainable. Um, let's see if I can get a better picture. I'm quite a stickler for something that's worthwhile to leave on the screen, that's good. Love the contrast. I think that blue accent, I mean, it's all gray. Platinum bezel insert, superb. Rhodium finish, and then you have this sharp blue second hand. I think Rolex needs to put more time into that kind of thinking, honing in on details like the second hand. Beautiful piece. Real men don't do niche, life says. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Yeah, talking about just, and, and I think another important thing with any channel is just trying to be as genuine as you can be. Uh, of course, you you can you can promote whatever you want to do, but I've always tried to be as, I mean, if, if I had to meet you in person right now, my attitude wouldn't change. I am just as I present myself on the show. 
And I think that's important. And the, the falseness that you see on a lot of channels nowadays, it's unreal. Um, and I've always tried to be down to earth, genuine, treat people like human beings. You're all human beings on the other side. And it's, it's important. I try my best to be as, um, you know, communicative with you all. <laughs> it's difficult when there's like 180 of you watching. <laughs> uh, anyway, so let's see. Let's see if I can catch up with everything. I've missed a few bits and pieces. Uh, let's go back to this G-Shock. I love this style. We're going to get back to the Yachtmaster in a second. So I had an idea of a series where I call it something along the lines of I, ID Guy Designs, and I design my own version of a G-Shock. Of all the watches out there, I can't, I can draw practically anything. Give me a product, an animal, a person, whatever else, I can draw it pretty well. But watches, maybe it's because I've seen so many uh, that, that it's designing your own watch is incredibly difficult. Uh, originality is a very hard thing at the best of times, but in the watch space, you know. But designing a G Shock, surprisingly, it's the one product, quote unquote, that I can sketch. So wouldn't it be cool to take elements from bits and pieces, put it together, show you know, bring you in to show you what design sketches would be like and renderings, and that'd be a lot of fun. Junior Johnson, I saw your comment on a on an earlier community post saying that you like that there's no watch snobbery. I don't think you know there shouldn't be. Um, I think the best enthusiasts are the ones who can appreciate everything, and there's a lot of people in in very high positions who can enjoy both watches that cost 300 pounds and watches that cost 300,000, you know? And uh, it's amazing. I mean, just Cam, Cam from Craft and Tailored. I talk about him a lot because he's such a genuine guy. Um, he, he sells watches everywhere from 1,000 pounds, 300 pounds, all the way up to hundreds of thousands. Great guy, so down to earth. Again, catching up, uh, Sifur Orient. We can pull that up now. Basel World 2020 predictions. Giza is bringing out some good questions. Uh, I'm actually bringing out a video just for you to hear on the channel uh, next week, Thursday. It's a surprise video, and uh, I put some renders together. Really had a lot of fun, so you'll enjoy that. And I'm just jumping back. So what do I think about this piece? I like the highlights. I like the blue and red accents, kind of Bauhausian in a way. This looks like it has a solar panel on the dial. Might be wrong. Um, I really am not well versed with G-Shock at all. I just know it's that watch that you jump to to use hard. And in saying that, I want to make a video about beta watches, talking about if they are really necessary or if you can just rock one watch and enjoy it with no problem. And beta watches in general seems to be a theme that we as a community have constructed. <laughs> so it should be a good discussion. I look forward to that. Um, okay, talking again about Let's see, geez, one thing I really hate about the live chat is that it has a mind of its own half the time. So the Yachtmaster Rhodium, a very understated watch, someone mentioned in the chat, and I missed, I missed who commented that. Uh, it's still available now, you can find it. And the sizes, it's amazing that the sizes range all the way from like 27 mils up to 42 at this point. Different finishes, different strap materials. Um, and what's even cooler, I was thinking of doing a video on Charlie Sheen's watches. And uh, it's amazing that in Two and a Half Men, he wore this uh, 35 millimeter reference of a Yacht Master all the way through. It's quite a charming little watch. I don't know if there, there won't be any up here, but uh, it's, it's quite a unique piece. And it doesn't exactly scream Rolex for the most part, uh, unless you know what you're looking for, of course. Love that contrast, though. And I see Mark P joining. Thank you for joining, Mark. I saw on the, on the Instagram uh, post that you were going to be late. It's great to have you here. Okay. Zenith, the Zenith Defy range. Okay, Weekday Hustle. That's a good idea. Zenith, Zenith is a very interesting brand. I've chatted about them at length. I really dig the Joe Sifur. I love that contrast. The blue is very important. And you have to get this watch on a beads of rice. Would you call this a beads of rice bracelet? Um, it's just such a character of its time. Again, cushion case, styled for that time period. We refer back to the Omega Mark II. So you want me to pull up a Zenith Defy Range Rover. Hmm. I have a feeling this could be pretty or it could be horrendous. Okay, I have seen this a few times. So it's a scale. I didn't know that this was linked with Range Rover. I see what they've done. So they've taken the, the detail from the rim of the Range Rover and used that as the backing. 
At least that's what I can see on first impressions. I have looked at this piece before. I don't know so much about these car collaborations. I mean, there was big talk about JLC and their collaboration with, was it Aston Martin? I don't know if they work so well all the time. Some, I, I like it when a company can innovate within that line. Like JLC had a special use of the pusher, the fact that you could push the glass to, to use it. Superb. Ron, welcome. Great having you here. Uh, just catching up with everyone while I talk through. Rolex is a great beta watch. It sure is. Depending on, depending on what you consider a beta watch, you know, Omega is a good beta watch. Uh, Breguet. Breguet is a fantastic beta watch. You know? <laughs> I'm catching up with you guys. I'm sorry if there's a bit of a pause. I'm hitting the wine. Um, so does the Zenith Range Rover get electrical meltdowns and oil leaks? I have no idea, Cheetown. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, better person to cover than Charlie Sheen, founder said. Yeah, Mark Wahlberg has an interesting collection. I think what pulled me to Charlie Sheen is his, is his choice of Patek Philippe's. Very unique selection. I wouldn't say they are the only pieces that, they're not the kind of pieces that the, the typical person would pick up. Uh, very unique perpetual calendars and uh, moon phases and all sorts. Lovely, but what time is it, Phil says. And that's the problem. The Defy range for me, the reason why I just can't, I just, it, it just irritates me. This has uh, Jean-Claude Biver's um, fingerprints all over it. The Defy range is really his way of putting Hublot DNA into these pieces. And uh, I mean, you, when you talk about Zenith, the fact that they've just brought out the, the A384 again as a reissue. And let's just pull that up again, because that's just absolute beaut. I love it. The A384, it's one of those pieces, it's like the Speedmaster. Um, it's one of those watches that's just stuck in time. Uh, what's a better picture? Monochrome has some of the best photos of all their pieces. I don't know if this is the reissue. It looks pretty legit. I don't know. The bracelet looks a little bit strange. But uh, the A384 is in it. I made a video about it, I would say, four or five months ago. And I spend a good time talking about the movement and why it is so effective and how, why it's so favored. But this reference, this is a superb leisure watch. The size might be difficult for some people. Um, but let's have a look. I see a question from Final Times Capital asking about the Hodinkee interview with Bethany. Oh, no. Again, geez. Um, it's so bad that I missed the chat. I'm going to catch up. Let me just slowly but surely scroll through here. I'll leave this little guy on the screen for the time being as I try and see. Once again, my name is tagged at so many things. Um, okay. I don't know where I lost. There was a question from Founders Times Capital asking me about thoughts about the Hodinkee interview with Bethany. I think there's so many more interesting people out there to interview in this space. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I don't actually think I watched it. Actually, no, I did. It was the first, technically the first woman that Hodinkee interviewed, right? And she was talking about how every watch was gifted to her from a separate boyfriend and everything else. I just, there's no passion in there. There's no real enthusiasm. Um, I mean, everyone's saying that Ellen DeGeneres would be a better option to interview. I don't know what Hodinkee is pulled like and whether they can get arrangements to speak to these people. But, you know, you need to find someone who is a true enthusiast. I mean, James Martin, the chef, he's always wearing Daytonas, for example. Rolex Daytonas is his thing, and he has about four of them, and you want to know why does he wear them. That kind of person is interesting. You know, maybe not to the majority because it's just a Rolex discussion, but, you know. Um, so stunt pilot Steph says, your channel made me interested in design. Do you have a book of recommendations about design elements? Hmm, I'll have to think about it. No, I mean, I've, I've pulled ideas <laughs> from all over the place. Education is very good. Uh, you learn about a lot of things. Off the top of my head, I can't say, uh, I, can't, I can't give you a clear book definition. There's some great documentaries. Uh, Dieter Rams is the person to watch. And there's a film called Objectified, which is brilliant. So if you just go into Google, type in Objectified. I think it came out in 2011 as a film. Superb. Covers everything to do with industrial design from all areas of the world and uh, really good. There's another Dieter Rams documentary, and he is basically the father of industrial design. Amazing, when you, uh, when you see him standing in a busy street in London, and you realize that most of what you see around you is because of this man's influence, but no one knows who this guy is. You know, he's an old guy at this point in time. 
Um, let's see what else is going on. I'd like to stick on certain questions. Uh, but Owens, this is probably won't get a lot of support, but I will be getting the Roger Dubuis Easy Diver. Let's have a look at that. So yeah, this piece to me, it just has Jean-Claude's uh, fingers all over. I mean, you look at the look at the date complication. Eight at the base of the dial there. It just it's just bizarre, right? You can you can't even see Zenith on the dial. It's just a mess. Let's pull up the Roger Dubuis. I want to try and keep the stream as a, far away from Horde as possible because it does get a little bit excessive at times. I don't know if you're looking at the chronograph or the one with the tourbillon. Yeah, I can see why this watch is slightly polarizing. Crazy looking dial and, and case. It looks like something out of a, a Gothic era. Really cool. Okay, I think I'm catching up. Sorry. Uh, Rolex is a great beta watch. Okay, now I think I'm getting to where I lost the chat. Cam Walker, thank you so much for the super chat. I've uh, I've missed it. You've probably been on here for quite a while. Really appreciate it. Um, it's such a pleasure doing this. I love talking to you guys. And it's a time when I can like reach out and chat to you all. Okay, I'm going to scroll down because um, I've missed so many of you guys. Really apologize. Uh, let's see. Zenith Defy, classic. There's one Zenith Defy that I really like, actually. And it is the... And it's because it just looks like an A384. And it was the Felix, the Felix Baumgartner Zenith that he wore when he did his effort of jumping. So he, he was part of the Red Bull. I don't even know what the, the theme was. I think that's the watch in its... I don't know how many references they made. But Felix was the guy who did that, that the longest skydive, and he jumped out of the Red Bull module. This was the watch he was wearing. I think it's a really good brand collaboration. I don't know the full extent of the story. Let's try and get a better image. Um, again, these, these unique watches to the family are quite difficult to, to find information on. Uh, there we go. So a little bit heavy, a little bit heavy duty. It doesn't exactly fall into leisure, but it's interesting. I like that that blend. Okay, Seiko 5. Hey, that's a good piece for this. That's a very good piece for this subject. I haven't discussed Seiko 5 in the slightest, and apparently there's a whole new range. Speaking of which, jeez, uh, SMNX01K1. My goodness. I think we'll get somewhere. Hey, this is very cool. This, this has a similar – I feel like this watch has – a tie to, <laughs> and James May wears this watch. You've got to know, it's a, it's a real geek's watch, in the most extent. It's really cool. I like that the streamlined nature, the where the crown's been integrated. Okay, and talking of which, there was mention that Grand Seiko released a new series today. So if I just type in Grand Seiko, twenty twenty, I'm sure we'll find something. What's their new range? I don't know. Can someone please highlight that in the chat? These are definitely not the new 2020 releases. And as we go through, um, yeah, John Colviva is a figure in urology. He is very, very underrated. Neil, you're right. I mean, he, was just, he was just given some, some lifetime award for his, his ability. He's done so much in this field um, with regards to bringing brands back to life. I mean, talk about Blanc Palm that he bought and sold. Um, Omega, so many brands, so many families that, that were on the cusp of dying that have really come back and still managed to, you know, last. Uh, I wouldn't say they have the best sales. Uh, Paul, welcome. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through the chat as I'm talking. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. There's talk, there's talk about horology. How, I don't know what's been going on. I, I generally don't watch watch channels for the most part because I'm either prioritizing what's coming out next week or the week after or preparing something. I watch the odd watch box videos. Craft and tailored I love because of Cam's knowledge on vintage pieces. Um, but for the most part, I really enjoy watch boxes, weekend watches or wake up with watches, whatever they call that segment when uh, you know Tim just sits there and just has like 15 pieces on the table and he just checks them out find it really enjoyable. Okay. Um, is there a cooler weekend watch than the Breitling top time? Now, but Owen says James May must run slow. Yeah, the Seiko 5. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can catch up. There hasn't been any highlight on the new uh, Grand Seiko pieces, and I definitely don't want dead air with you guys on the show. So I'm just going to leave it on here. I love this red dial. Very unique. Grand Seiko. There was talk talking about the uh, 
the Alpinist video that I did on Thursday, there was talk, how cool would it be if a brand like Grand Seiko adopted the Alpinist? The strategy, I think, was a bit missed with the Alpinist, the way that they've now introduced the Prospects line and kept it under that banner. Wouldn't it have been better if they moved the Alpinist, have one side of the family where Seiko uses it, the other side, Grand Seiko uses it, and you get something like the Grand Seiko Alpinist Snowflake. Can you imagine how cool that would be? You know, Grand Seiko taking those dials that they make so well and incorporate their movements. And so you really have an entry level Alpinist, and then you also have super high end. I think that would be a nice blend. Wristwatch experience saying Tim's stream of stream of consciousness. Is that what you, I, I'm not reading's bad. It's amazing. I don't know how he does it. He is just an encyclopedia. I really often want to say, just take a breath, Tim, take a breath. We're here to listen to you. You don't have to rush, you know? Um, I should take that advice. But uh, he does, like, sometimes he does get a bit excessive with the way he he can just go. I'd, I would be exhausted if I was that guy. I don't know how he does it. He must be quite big on the coffee coffee game. Vintage IWC is cool. Sure is. Um, Tim would make a great lawyer. Yeah, I mean, he would be able to finish his statement before the judge even, you know, can, can wake up to the fact that Tim's talking. <laughs> uh, very interesting guy, though. I'd love to meet him. I think meeting up with Watchbox would be awesome. I'd love to have a round table discussion with the guys. And, uh, you know, it's cool. This hobby is, is fascinating. There's some really, I think what makes this hobby so fun for all of us is that we're all interesting people. And, um, well, let's say most of us are all interesting people. Okay, let's pull up a cool watch. What's another cool reference? Um, let me think. Let's pull up the Blancpain bathyscaphe that BS was wearing or is wearing. Now, of all the bathyscaphes, this one is such a killer. What is the name of this piece again? 50 Fathoms, day date 70s. So this is a piece that pays homage to the 70s reference that they created, obviously. That's another, another reissue. But look how beautiful that dial is. This is what the, the bathyscaphe was about, by the way. This, the way that the, the dial's been laid out here, of course, it's quintessential 70s in every way. But the brown, the highlights, the size, the spacing, everything's being considered here. The modern bathyscaphe, the way it looks now, looks very peculiar. Anyway, um, can't bring myself to drop that kind of money when it says Seiko. Ah, Shaz, I, I feel the same way. Um, I'm not someone who's really glued to Seiko. Maybe I'll change my mind over the years. But, uh, you know, I'm in that I'm in that hunting stage for my first luxury watch. I cannot wait. Oh, and and Jersey <laughs> Ninja. Uh, looking up the, the Hodinkee version, we'll have a look at that now. So again, I was saying that I think what they've done so well with the chronograph is it looks like the numerals and everything, the, the consideration on the dial has been very good here. It looks like everything's balanced and well-spaced. And for that reason, uh, it does seem a lot more coherent. There was a question about my thoughts on the Barracuda. Is the Barracuda or Barracuda? See, because I own a Barracuda jacket, so get confused. I think it's beautiful. This was made for the Polish military, if I remember right. It's a very specific model. Longpon has an incredible, incredible history. I don't think I've covered it enough, honestly. And there are so many other references in the family, like the Air Command. But of course, I think they only made like 100 of these. It's a reissue of some kind. Um, and her dinky edition, I think they played it way, way too safe. I think I'm going to open up a separate tab since we're on it now. Uh, Blanc Pan, Hodinkee. And uh, when it comes down to creating a watch like this, honestly, you don't have to be in the design industry. You don't have to be someone who has any knowledge uh, in this area. You just have to think practically. And I think that's what's made it so effective is that it is a practical looking watch. Um, it's so basic. It's so simple. It's like, well, hey, how can we make this thing sell? Give it pencil hands. Give it the simple Explorer layout and then give it the faux patina look. Fade the bezel. I mean, Hodinkee's big on that. They did the, the exact same thing with the Oris 65 edition of theirs. And then just add like 150% on the watch and you've got a winner, right? And uh, Clive saying the Squally, the Squale li Lion shot. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll just say, it's, I don't find it a pretty looking watch whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, Ryan saying, Lungo Odyssey, something to discuss. Very original. 
Okay. Ron asking, thank you for the super chat, Ron. What are the three watches you're consider considering to buy? Well, I will say as far as everything goes that Omega is on the top of my list as a brand and modern, Ob modern Omega. I don't want to, I don't want to like ruin the surprise just yet. Uh, let's pull up the Lungo Odysseus. It's always worth talking about. It's uh, whether or not you, you call it Odysseus or Odysseus or however else. We can chat about this watch a little bit more. Uh, come on, work with me here, sweetheart. This magic mouse. I think it's her time of the month. So talking about my three watches that I'm considering to buy. I'll tell you the three brands. I would say Omega is top, way top. Um, I would consider Rolex possibly as a first watch, something quite unique about that. But really, I haven't thought beyond Omega. That's as far as I'll say, Ron. I don't want to spoil the surprise yet for everyone, but you will find it to be a great choice. I think it, it lines up a lot with what I try to preach on this page. So not only is it a great watch, but uh, it'll also line up with what we do here, and it should be a lot of fun. Really look forward to it. Uh, and, and Paul says, if if every one of your subscribers donated one pound each, you could get yourself a very nice one. Absolutely. Jeez, imagine I could get a Panda Daytona. <laughs> that would be amazing, right? Um, okay. Uh, Phil says, CMOS new wave dial. Yes, that's one of the watches that I'm looking at. Very hard. Absolutely. You're getting warmer. Shane, thank you so much for the super chat. And Paul, really appreciate it, guys. Um, again, I said in the beginning of the stream, I'm going to delay this gratification until the end of the year. 57 C Master Tom Austin says, yes, that's one of the pieces. Absolutely. Um, anyway, so I'm going to delay this gratification until the end of the year because I feel like I want to see where this page goes. I want it to be a reward uh, in the end. And yeah. I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope to go and try on the watch very, or the watches very soon. So the Lungo Odysseus, let's get to this before we get anywhere further. Okay. So the best thing I can say about this watch, it's, um, it's a sad reality, but it's a watch that I have never really returned to after it was first launched. Now take that away as you will. Um, whether or not that's a good or bad thing. I, I personally do not find it very interesting. Um, look, for the most part, they've kept the DNA there, right, which is cool. But I think, you know, the, the choice of a blue dial, stainless steel, it feels like they're trying to just jump on the bandwagon of all the other hot steel sports brands. And that's partly why I thought that the Moser, the Moser Streamliner, Great, I really love that video. If, if you haven't seen it, I put it out a week ago. I found the Moser Streamliner to be so unique because they haven't just created a watch with a time and date complication. They've jumped on their own chronograph bandwagon with a flyback or automatic um, cushion case, very 70s, but in a different way. And it's amazing. I think it's such a fascinating watch. This, on the other hand, when they say they spent five years developing this, I, I think that they're speaking a bit of BS, um, just talking about the braces integration. This doesn't look as refined as it could have been. I really don't enjoy, if we just pull this up on a, on a side view, I really don't enjoy the way that it flares out to try and match the lugs. It's nice that it tapers, sure, but it just doesn't seem, uh, it's very conflicting. And there was a question earlier about whether this should be on a rubber strap or not. I did a video a while back talking about this one. I actually had a presentation at the beginning of a live show last year sometime when I put it on a leather strap and a rubber strap. It doesn't look that great, honestly. Uh, I played around with, with the pushes on either side and just the proportions where the second hand is placed. It's a peculiar thing. I think when you look at a watch and you, you question just where everything is set, that means that there's something that might be astray. And with, with regards to looking at the, the Moser Streamliner, let me pull it up again. I really enjoy this watch for its uniqueness. I really hope that Moser manages to uh, make this watch a lot more mainstream and bring it out in greater numbers. When I look at this watch, the only area that I wanted to improve was to make that 60 flush with all the other numerals on the dial. And that's what made it so cool in my eye. It wasn't a watch that I wanted to physically go in and try and edit and fix because I just found it such a crazy, strange, fascinating piece 
where the longer I had a full on presentation where I, I took the size of the, of the date windows down and moved them around, rearranged the dial. I don't know. It's all up to interpretation. Of course, everything I say is opinionated. So don't take, take it all with a grain of salt or a pinch of salt. Um, so let's see what else is going on. There was a question about the best contemporary dress watch, Giza says. Mm, that's a very good question. You know, Laurent Ferrier, amazing piece. I'm slowly but surely getting into these Hort watches. Look, I'm by no means, um, I'm sure it's a Laurent Ferrier. I am by no means someone who is n like knowledgeable with regards to movements and everything else. I am very new to this hobby. I mean, I only began really following watches in what, 2014, 2015. And just thought it would be nice to put some, you know, design-related discussion into the game. Laurent Ferrier, I think, is a watch that really manages to ride the line well. There are other pieces like Parmigiani, um, FP Jean. I mean, geez, what am I saying? FP Jean is another brand, absolutely beautiful. Let's pull up a Sovereign or Sovereign or Sovereign or however you want to say it. FP Jean. Absolutely beautiful. I love the, the numerals, the balance. What, what's a good color, a good metal finish? So I, I made a video about the, the chron chronometer blue. And in it, I found that the sub seconds was a bit peculiar the way it was placed. Where the Sovereign, what it does so well is it manages to set not only the power reserve, but the sub seconds offset. I need a better photo. Let's get something a bit more head on. Uh, this is good. Bexon, another great page for, for pho photographs. And of course, the mouse, with these high-res images, the mouse takes a little time. So between these two brands, Giza, great question. Thank you for bringing it up. I think the two best contemporary dress watches that we've seen recently, F.P. Jean and Laurent Ferrier are two pieces that really attract me because they managed to define their own direction. Regzep, Regzepi is another brand. <laughs> I've missed so many chats. I'm going to scroll through here as everyone's talking. And Laurent Ferrier, Keytown says, that's cool. Um, here's a new GS, GS Snowflake, Ellie Dial. Okay, awesome, thank you, Tom. Okay, really a nod to historic pocket watches. That's interesting, Giza. So he says that the way that the subdial has been placed, that's very true. And, that, and just, just the seconds hand alone really mirrors that, right? So I was saying, what makes this watch so cool is I love the, the asymmetry shared between this power reserve and the subdial. There's a balance, a balance to unbalance, very much like the longer one. And again, the Laurent Ferrier, I just love the, the Asagai hands and especially this reference. I don't know what it's called. It's called the micro rotor. It's got an onion, would you call this an onion style crown? Beautiful case. I think the case has almost like a corn de vache element to it. Where's a better photo of it? This is pretty good. I just love the flow and the form of this. I mean, this talking about a leisure watch, this really is something unique. And these are just so crazy expensive, of course. Uh, and there's so many others. I'm just I'm just spitballing on the fly. And I hope Rigzep Rizepi, possibly my favorite independent. Ron, I was trying my best to find the name and I just couldn't. I cannot for the life of me remember the name. And now I have. I think the other day I managed to pull it up. There's such interesting watches out there. Uh, and really, it's it's crazy just how, just when you think you're getting on top of things, so <laughs> another brand comes on, uh, you know, just when you think you've learned your Patek Philippe references, so there's like 15 more that you haven't. It's a very interesting brand. I think it rides the line more along the classical side of things, very pocket watch. I mean, the way that the hands have been set up, very pocket watch in the styling. But the way that the dial has been arranged with these numerals and this, this track that runs over and then under and then over, you notice that there is a triangle form. Let's see if I can highlight this. I don't know how well you can see it on your screens, but there's a triangle formed across and then there's a separate one other side. Really interesting. Reminds me of watchmaker numerals. and Ah, it's cool. Okay. Lots of my name tagged in and I do miss your comments. I apologize. I am slowly but surely getting through and talking about the relic explorer dubbed as the steam McQueen. Yeah, that was a fail. Why, why that was, and the film that really caused it was the hunter 1980. Um, oh my goodness. So Tippy saying, check out the Mule Tula Hubble I'm going to try and get that name. 
I definitely don't want to get into too much whole horology stuff because that really drains me when we get into the crazy, crazy references. I want this to be a bit more uh, mild tonight. We're talking about, you're saying, oh, wow. <laughs> this is perfect. Thank you for that, Tippy. So he's saying, he's saying this is what the Lunga Odysseus was inspired by. Bang on. I mean, the, the bracelet integration, yeah, pretty much hits it on the head. That's funny. That's cool. Um, here's another even better example. I really think this bracelet format is, is just could be so much better. And made in Germany. I mean, they're all, they all share the same kind of language. Thank you, Tippy, for that suggestion. So it's cool. I've actually caught up to the chat. Paul Newman actually wore Daytona's your orange hand. Orange hand should know because, I mean, he is the watch. He is the 1655. And, uh, oh, it's a beautiful watch. I always bring it up. I bring it up every show. So why not just bring it up again? I, uh, I've spoken about this at length for months. And just as I've been speaking about this piece, so the value seems to be slowly creeping up. Uh, it's gone up by at least five grand since I started talking about this watch. I don't know if I've had an influence, but this watch will continue to always fascinate me. In the Rolex family, I think it's its own beast. And uh, yeah, so the movie The Hunter, 1980, with Steve McQueen, he wore a Submariner, and now it's probably a 5513 at that stage. And because the, the film was so, you know, the quality of films were not good enough, you didn't have great screens to watch back in the day. They weren't able to discern that it was just a simple Submariner and not. And then, of course, the Italian collectors and everyone just started giving it Steve McQueen name. Um, but I find this to be such a fascinating watch. And I was actually thinking about this just before the stream started, because if I pull up this week's Live 5 again, um, the, the Speedmaster Mark II and the 1655 fall into the same category, the same kind of error, right? And I think what has really dated the Speedmaster Mark II and left the 16.5 to be something that's a bit more of a contemporary icon is the case design. I think, you know, say what you like about Rolex, whether you like them or not, but they were so forward thinking with regards to keeping their case designs fairly similar. They, they were producing the crazy 70s style pieces with quartz and everything else. But the fact that they were able to still keep the GMT style cases, the, the Submariner, the Oyster case in its entirety, it is what has left this watch, kept this watch so timeless, I think. You need something that pulls you back to it to realize that it is a watch from a family. This might have been, this, the Seamaster might have been a bit of a, uh, too big of a step um, for them. And that might be why the opinion is divided on this watch. Some people are devoted to the, to the, the, the Speedmaster Mark II, um, but it's polarizing. Interesting. I'm sure this watch does divide opinion, uh, but I find it to be one of the most fascinating pieces. My, my design brain kicks in when I look at it. You know, very 70s, and that's, that's really what a lot of people don't like. I mean, when this watch was released back in the day, no one was really keen on it um, because it's just so bizarre and strange. Okay. Uh, so let's see, Omega has aged very poorly, Chazbot says. Let's pull out a um, just a standard Speedmaster. Amazing story. I look forward to highlighting the, the development of the Alaska project and just where it went. But everyone wants the moon watch, and that has really given them such a big footing in the industry. So jumping back to leisure watches, uh, let's. what I'm going to do, let's pull up a piece. Pull up the Roger Dubuis. <laughs> Uh, it's so funny. What's another cool watch we can look at quickly? Well, to show original 70s, G-Town says, I think we've chatted about this watch so many times already. Is there anything else we could pull up uh, <laughs> by winning? Uh, that's funny, Giza. I'm just scrolling up in the chat to see if I can catch up with something. Um, let me think. What's a good reference to pull up? Uh, let's, okay, jumping back to weekend leisure watches. I'm actually going to pull up, I, I won't call it, I won't call it olive. I'll just call it 34 mil Rolex and we'll see what we get. Amazing how this watch has, it's divided opinion a lot. So this video I brought out on Tuesday this week. It was a brief discussion talking about this piece. Geez, they do photographs well. 
I think this might be a 39. So this is a 39 piece. Uh, there's very few 34 mil pieces out there. Very 50-50. Patek Philippe Neptune. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> As I say that, suggestion of a watch to look at. So I get like five of them. Uh, the Tudor Tiger Chrono Panda. Ron, that's cool. Uh, I haven't chatted to Ron today, so let's get that up. It's awesome. How are you enjoying your 5002, Ron? So I, you, you have this watch. I think you, you asked me to look at this watch a while back. You've been rocking this lately or something similar. I do like the numerals on this piece. Tudor had a strange time period in the in the 90s. I would imagine this watch is from the 90s era. Where's a good image to use? That's pretty good, I guess. I went through a strange period <laughs> where they just threw everything and, and hoped something was uh, considered purchasable. Breguet Marine Royal. Okay, lots of suggestions. So what is strange about this piece? This has this adopts the the, the offshore. We can probably affiliate this design styling to the offshore now, AP Royal Oak. Is it effective? It's nice that the, the 30 on the subdial lines up with the central chronograph hand and the same with the, the 12 hours at the base. That's pretty cool. That symmetry is nice, but there is a lot of asymmetry to the dial as well. It does seem a bit counter heavy, not as balanced. Okay, I'm going to pull up some other stuff. Let's see. Uh, wow, that already is awful. Roger Dubuis, <laughs> that was from Bud Owens earlier. Okay, Patek Neptune, I think I know what this watch is. It's that bizarre looking square piece, right? Did I just say Nep? Oh, cool. I've actually looked at this piece a lot before. This is a strange reference in the family, hey? Uh, let's see where we can go. Should we look at the salmon dial? Wow, that is that is just nuts. Okay, let's keep it simple. I've looked at this piece before. I don't know what to make of it. It has it has that um, the 6006 reference behind it, wouldn't you say? Um, peculiar looking watch, though. Great for leisure. I mean, it, it fits into that leisure wearing experience for sure. So you have a power reserve, day date, not just a date, moon phase, sub seconds, offset. I would imagine this uses the same caliber as the 5712 Nautilus because the dial layout looks pretty much bang on the same. There's another picture from Chrono24. Pretty cool looking piece. I wouldn't say it epitomizes Patek in, uh, you know, what's nice is that it is very understated. If we are to pull up the leisure, list again uh what does it what does it reach it's complication no complication it's up to debate uh, let's have a look reggae marine okay geezer good that was a good guess for me i'm just looking at the format on the dial and you can just sort of like jump around is this the brigade neptune just want to make sure that i hope i got this right um popeye's favorite you know olive also <laughs> it's funny uh, popeye was a hell of a cartoon back in the day yeah? Okay, let's see. Breguet 5847. Breguet is a family of watches that I'd love to invest more time in. Uh, I, I made a video about the, the Classique and, okay, talking about the Marine. Okay, cool. And so this ver these variants of the Marine are very hit and miss, I would say, for the most part. There's a good reference. I think they have gone just, just ever so slightly excessive with this piece. Okay, so this piece has a alarm, I would imagine. So it has some kind of deep sea alarm, and you can normally tell that by the little music box, little little what's that, a quaver, on the dial. Jeez, no my music references. Um, and over here we have a power reserve indicator for the alarm. So it's just simple. It's it's like a memo box, and it has a diving bezel. It's a little bit excessive though. Um, this watch does look quite cool on a rubber strap, but geez, it looks it looks so manly which is kind of why I, I prefer the Marine that has the more traditional looking layout. This looks like they've reached a little bit too far into the, into the realms. Catching up with the chats while swallowing wine. I hope I got the Neptune in the last question. Um, Speedmaster Skydweller, Solar Impulse Limited Edition Color Scheme, Speedmaster X3. Geez, okay, I can have a look at some of those. I should have written in the 70s. So Mr. Ninja is asking about that piece. We've chatted about it before, and it is very peculiar. I just want to catch up with everyone, and I will pull up the piece. My favorite budget weekend is the Orient Star. Something about these, these 
Eastern watches with their references. It's just, it's like Omega and their references, you know? Um, the music symbol is the eighth note to be says. Apologies. It's not, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's not a quaver. I'm sure it's a quaver, isn't it? Is that what they call it? I, I, I studied music for a while and just learned that I could play music better by ear than, than reading notes. <laughs> Okay, so the Breguet violates your rule with sports watches shouldn't collide with Dressy, Forbin says. Very good point. Um, it's that, yeah, and the, what I tried to emphasize with the, the Seiko Alpinist video is that when watches ride the line, I'll just pull up the Marine again. When watches ride the line between sports and dress, it divides opinion greatly. So we just looked at that Marine, and then all of a sudden we have this piece. This looks a lot more like a dress watch but is categorized as a sports watch with its, its titanium case and everything else. It's an eighth of a whole note. Thank you, Tippy. Thank you. That's it. You're right. You're right. And it's, it's very quick as, as, it's, as it's shorter. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so useless in music. So um, it does collide with that rule. Very, very good point there. And it was from Forbin. I think Forbin class has highlighted that point. The Cartier driver, Blancpain Erotica, I don't think YouTube will like that. Erotica watches, I think, are awesome. Pisa, I really think they're slick, uh, especially when they are at the back of the pieces. And and the the crazy thing is, the real joke is that they are works of art. The movement, the way they've arranged the movement on those pieces, yeah, I think Cartier, it's a little bit excessive. Um, what have they done here? It's just too much, way too much. I don't know what they're thinking in this this region. Cartier, as we know, has a long scale of pieces, uh, whether it's tanks, whether it's um, Santos's, <laughs> this looks a little bit excessive. And there's a Roadster version as well, which is also extreme in the family. Cartier tank. I was actually thinking of using a Cartier tank for, um, for the cover of the screen. Let's pull it up. Cartier tank. So this watch divides opinion a lot. Many say that it shouldn't be a man's watch at this in this time period, this point in time. But I think it does say something about someone who wears a watch as understated as this. And it's crazy just how small um, <laughs> these watches get. You can get Cartier tanks that are like 20, not even 20 mils in size. I tried on a white gold one when I was um, with Cam from Craft and Tailored. He visited London. And uh, it was crazy. It was white gold. It was tiny, tiny. And I, I couldn't say I really fell in love with it. But it's a cool watch. You can't, you can't go wrong with a tank. Uh, it's a real classic piece. Um, root beer NATO is such a cool look, Ron says. Okay, so let's actually, let's just bring the discussion back to everything else. Let's, uh, okay, first I'll pull up the, the GO. And what was it? 70s. I find this watch to be very peculiar. We've chatted about it before. There's been a few discussions and questions around it. Whether you look at the chronograph or just the standard, I just don't think it lines up with the family. You know, I always say glass, it's, it's glass shooter. I always say glass shooter, but no. And that's a horrible resolution picture. Beautiful dials, though. You can't go wrong with I mean, these are Fume dials, I would imagine. That's what you would call them. But I think that 70s aesthetic, the TV style aesthetic, is a little bit too old. You know, um, uh, I think it's, you know, it rides the line. And then they've, they've incorporated a integrated bracelet style with the case. Love the finish on the dial, though. Very bright. And returning back to uh, leisure watches, hell, this stands out like a sore thumb and a, a green thumb. <laughs> it looks great for that reason. Whether or not that's your thing, I don't know. My, my appeal for leisure watches, it needs to be a piece that has less complication, something that you can put on. I think the real point that I want to underline, which you can't really see very well, apologies about that. You don't want to think about watches. Let's see if I can highlight that there. It's, it's a watch that you wear when you don't want to think about watches, which is partly why I enjoy the, the 1016 aesthetic, for example. And I think, it's, I think it's cool. I mean, it all depends. It all depends on your taste. This is a very open-ended subject, once again. Some people say the longer one is a better choice for a leisure watch. Other people would have a more simple dress piece. It's all up to opinion. And talking about the 60s GO, and it's the diver, right? The 60s diver. The one thing, oh, cool. Hell, this is better. 
there's a few brands that have incorporated this this aesthetic, but I think the Suta has been the one that has really taken this this numeral layout. What I'll say, I mean, this has to be one of the most polarizing pieces in a, in any dress watch family around. What's a good example? Here we go. It's pretty cool. I want to try and highlight the dial. What I like so much about these numerals, yes, they're very peculiar. I mean, they really aren't up everyone's alley for sure. But what I like is that when you squint your eyes and you look at just the sheer symmetry between the numerals on the dial, you can't get better. Just have a look. They all look like slits. You know, if you're a gynecologist, I'm sure you'd be able to tell us what they represent. Um, and there's a question from, from Vibrant asking, what do you think about what is happening? I have no idea what anyone is talking about, really. I'm not someone who digs for dirt or anything else, but I really don't know what anyone's talking about with the subject. I heard there was news about a Daytona, but that's all I know. Um, I would like to know more, actually. If someone could comment about that in the chat, it would be good, but I really have no idea. There was a discussion about it recently. I think I caught it on a live stream. I have no idea what's been going on with Horology House. Um, I enjoy his stuff. I like his photography, and his YouTube channel has vanished. You're kidding me, Giza. That is insane. No, I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. Telling you that from the bottom of my heart, no idea what's going on. Again, I'll emphasize, I spend all my time working on this page. <laughs> and uh, on the off chance, uh, I, I catch a few bits and pieces around. Gynecologist for men is a, is a gynecologist. Is that so, Forwin? I thought it was a, um, a, pr a proctologist. No, that's, that's for... And that's for another region. I think Ron will be able to clarify that a bit more. So he says, and I'm just catching up with everyone else. There was actually a great suggestion from Bud. We were talking about that. There's someone, someone mentioned Vacheron overseas. I haven't chatted about the overseas in a long time. That makes a brilliant watch. I think Vacheron watch, <laughs> as I'm typing, the overseas makes a Brilliant, fantastic leisure watch. And the, the, the point was that because this watch comes with a leather strap and a rubber strap, you wear the leather and the rubber over the weekend. <laughs> you can take that away with whatever you want. Uh, but during the week, you can wear it on a strap, on a, on a steel bracelet. And it just, it works. <laughs> you can wear rubber on a weekend. <laughs> oh, I crack myself up sometimes, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, geez, and this complication, what I love so much about what they've done with this is just that sheer attention to symmetry, that beauty, that balance between everything on the dial. Look at that. Absolutely stunning. Love the contrast too. I don't know, that would be rose gold. <clears throat> rose gold conflicting with that blue. Absolutely beautiful. Um, okay, let's see what's going on. He deleted his Facebook and Instagram set to private. I really had no idea. I'm going to follow up on that, but that is a shame because his stuff was great. I, I really don't know much about what happens in the watch space at all. I'm not the person to ask for any of this stuff. Um, SKX is my current leisure watch. It's a great point. I don't know why the screen is acting up on me. Let's get something better up. So these pieces, I think, and, and I've highlighted this. I think I, I chatted about Vacheron uh, somewhere mid last year saying that the overseas is a watch that you should really pay attention to. I think they've hit the, the ball out of the park with this reference. I think this is the third generation or the fourth generation of the overseas. Great development over time. Um, and Bud Owens highlighting the Rolex Explorer of Vacheron overseas. Three hand by a definition would be the ones. Yeah, absolutely. Bud Owens, uh, Rolex Explorer. It's, and I've, I am working on a write-up on this little Smith's Everest that I just love and adore wearing. And what I try to emphasize is that I really, I think the Explorer line in the Rolex family is one line that truly is something that even someone who isn't an enthusiast or someone who isn't interested in the family can really enjoy, um, especially this little Smith's Everest. I emphasize again, anyone new who's joining the page, I think anyone in this game, any enthusiast, should look at this piece because it's just such a lot of fun to wear. You're, you're basically experiencing a 1016 with a modern movement. Oh, look at this watch. Isn't that a stunner? This and the little bits and pieces, maybe it's, maybe it is tacky that it's, that the, the Maltese cross is being overused on the bezel and on the bracelet. And uh, there, there's a relationship between all the parts, which is cool. Maybe it is overemphasized, but I think that the package, really speaks to what Vacheron's doing with their sports pieces. 
It's a pity they're so damn expensive though. Okay, I'm going to scroll up and then back down. Um, so James Conn saying, to me, a leisure watch is a watch I can wear to get coffee, go to barbecue, or be in last minute stand in for a <laughs> oh, good one. Good one. Uh, I want an AP Royal Oak, but settle in the Casio Royal Oak. Hey, you're saving a lot of money. You know, you could buy a car with the savings. Yeah, so talking about Vacheron is really cool. Weekend for rubber for you overseas. Cheat town. Yeah, that's it, man. Weekend for rubber. <laughs> Uh, my opinion on Icopod by now Mark Newson. There have been suggestions about Icopod often, and I have missed a lot of them in the past. Thank you for the suggestion. And that was from, <laughs> oh, geez, I missed so many. I have to scroll back up again. Damn it. It's amazing how many chats I miss. Apologies. I can't see your name now. It's disappeared. Reggae Classic, if he says the 5177, absolutely beautiful. Uh, James Conn. Okay, I've caught up now. We will get there eventually, ladies and gentlemen. So the Icopod. Really cool piece. Let's pull that up for a second. So Mark Newson, Australian industrial designer, and he's created some really cool stuff, very polarizing for the most part, but his watches are really something special. What makes it cool is that, where's a high-res image of the piece? This is as good as it gets. That is the worst resolution I've ever seen. So industrial design for the most part is generally about texture. Where can we find a good image? Here's an example. So, you know, industrial design is always about reducing. Less is more, as they say. It's so cliche at this point in time. Uh, what they've done well here is he, his, his DNA really got implemented into the Apple Watch. I think he had a better role or a greater role in the development of the Apple Watch than Jonathan Ive did. You know, when we talk about industrial designers and, and rock star designers and all of that stuff, um, you know, Jonathan Iov has been quoted to basically take all the ideas that Dieter Rams used on his his pieces for Braun. Long story. We can talk about industrial design in a later show, where Mark Newson is a lot more original with the way he approaches things. This isn't the best example. The one I want to show you is this detail with that. There we go. Industrial design is really all about texture at the end of the day. You want something that, you know, communicates the material well. And this is a good example. This is a watch, but I'm trying to get the, the resolution up for you guys to see. Um, so it's a really cool. Marcello, I think it's a very interesting brand. It's not one that I've really focused on a lot. I am personally not someone who is interested in industrial designed watches, uh, watches that have been designed by industrial designers. You know, the thing about industrial design is you're supposed to be a master of knowing how everything is manufactured but I really see just the industry, the watch industry, and how much versatility and variety there is out there. Much more interesting watches out there. You don't need to be someone who really needs to appreciate the minimalist approach, because that's what industrial design is generally, when there's just so much variety out there from other brands. you know, I would much rather go for a Swiss name that's been around for 180 years, dot, dot, dot. Okay, Neo says, just in case you get a midweek urge, why wait till the weekend? We're we talking about live shows. Um, I, I really, I don't know if you're mentioning, thank you for the super chat, by the way, Neo. Um, let me pull up another watch. Let's see, the GS, okay. There's been, I think, Tom, you, you highlighted the, um, this is probably a snowflake, SBGA421. Oh, wow, is this it? This is a new reference. Apologies for not getting to it earlier. I've been uh, jumping all over the show. This is absolutely beautiful. Well done. So this is their anniversary piece, I would imagine. Yeah, 20 hours ago. This is brand new. Absolutely beautiful. We're going to talk about that now. I love that red highlight. Why don't I do a midweek show? I try and keep it for the weekends because everyone's, you know, comfortable and at home and, and everything else. And it's a time for me to end my week off almost, sign off on what's happened over the course of the week. So I can tell you about what's been going on, what the new videos are about and everything else. So, this, so apparently the price of this watch is shocking. So I would imagine it's just it's a titanium case, snowflake. All they've literally done is just add red accents. So uh, it's not exactly groundbreaking, but it's beautiful. I think red accents, anything with a highlight. It's crazy how much a spot color can change things. 
And then we have another piece. What is this? This looks like it's in the same piece. Okay. Beautiful. Can't go wrong with the snowflake. But again, me and Seiko, I still don't fully follow Seiko as a, as a family. Um, damn you people. Now I'm obsessed with the five-digit root beer. Is that so, Ron? Well, let's pull it up just to irritate you more. Five-digit root beer. And I'm not even going to try and guess the reference. Hold on. One, six, seven, five. It's like, a, it's like a 16618, I don't know. I used to be good with my root beer references. No, I'm useless. Where is the reference number? I'll just pull up vintage root beer Rolex. Let's see. Let's have a look. They are beautiful. And of all the pieces in the family, I'm not so much of a fan of the nipple dials. Um, I think they're a little bit old school. The ideal piece for me, is a reference like this with a standard matte dial. Would be nice to have that sunburst effect as well, that tiger's eye effect. Um, but it's beautiful. I love that contrast, that caramel finish. Ron, you should jump on this piece, honestly, if you can. I mean, I, I don't know what they're going for nowadays. Um, now, I don't know the difference between the Clint Eastwood version and the regular. I think the Clint Eastwood had a full brown bezel. You might be wrong on that point. Let's pull this up and just let it sit while I catch up. Uh, and there's talk about the Everest, so I've probably missed a lot of chats as I will get in. Blood snow, Mr. Marcus says. That's funny. Um, Mr. Marcus asking again about Horology House. I really don't know what's going on. I have no idea. I've heard now, the first time, quite literally the first time I've heard that the channels has appeared. Um, that is that's as far as I've gotten. I haven't been involved in or, or learned about any of this quote-unquote drama. And Ron saying, talking about Ming watches. It's another brand that I really don't know. In something, welcome. Welcome to the show. I, uh, I Capod is a similar to Porsche design that I like. You know. But Owens, thank you so much for joining. Um, leisurely mow my lawn. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. I think I've managed to catch up with people in the chat. Okay. I'm going to now pull up a Ming watch. This is beautiful. I think it's so cool. Patek Neptune we can check out. Check out from. Ming watches seems like Kmong watches. That won't really go well. <laughs> um, Ming watches. So this seems like the same kind of watch that falls into the ballpark of FP Jean when it comes to hype and social media. It seems like this watch has really been pushed thanks to social media. Am I wrong in saying that? I don't know. Um, but they're watches that are very hard to get very sought after and i really don't know about them here they they're not uh, they kind of fall into that icopod styling right a little bit more uh, old school interesting dials i mean geez love the finish love the balancing but overall i don't i don't have an opinion on this watch yet it needs to have a discussion a write-up a proper write-up where i can sit down and talk about it um so uh, Ron's saying, does anyone own one of those Smith's Explorer watches? I love the 1016, so they've always called to me. But I can't tell if the quality is good or not. Ron, I can honestly say, uh, I handed this watch around to watchmakers at a meetup, and they were wearing Patek 5712s, Rolex 43mm Sea Dwellers, and this watch was being passed around like a, I won't say, I won't say anything uh, derogatory. I'm not, I'm not drunk enough. But it was being passed around a lot, and people were, they really enjoyed it. They loved the, the size. It's amazing just how well this piece lines up with a 1016 uh, with regards to proportions and everything. It's a micro brand, so take that as you will. But I just enjoy it so much. It, it feels like a vintage 1016. Only difference with this is that it has my own little aftermarket rivet bracelet on it. It doesn't have any stretch or anything to it, and it just wears like a dream. So comfortable. Anyway. Um, Ming is cool. The new World Time has a hand-finished movement. Amazing, but it's not cheap. And I was thinking about it. I saw the name Ming and thought, okay, cool. Nice to look at. And I thought to myself, you know, this watch maybe would fall into the ballpark of you know, a grand, two grand. But they are, like, exceptional. The prices are ridiculous for these pieces. So it's all up to your own preference. Um, I'm not exactly sold on them yet. I do need to do a write-up on these pieces. This is a 24-hour time. That's pretty cool. Um, Okay, managing to catch up, not really. I, what happens is I sit and talk, and then I have to catch up with the chat in some way or another. Uh, my thought of Breguet tradition, Tippy says. 
<laughs> Ming is not positive, Tom. You're right. Yeah, and that's why I uh, – and Mong isn't, isn't a great word either. Okay. Ming started by collectors, including Ming, the photographer. So they're hype for sure. But the newer ones have great movements. Thanks for that and something. Really cool. Uh, and Giza asking me, great questions, Giza. You're really hitting the nail on the head with your questions. What is the most important part of a watch for you? Dial, case. Bits of both. We are immediately attracted to the dial of the watch, I would say. For the most part, that is the element that really pulls you in. But it's that complementary nature that I think makes a watch so interesting, which is why some do it so well. Others just look generic. Um, very good question. I don't actually know how best to answer that. It's all dependent on the watch at the end of the day, um, whether it fits comfortably. It, it could be something as simple as size being the element that attracts you to it, you know? Whether it's a little bit undersized so it fits more comfortably. What kind of finish is on the dial? What kind of finish is on the case? I'm more someone, the more I'm getting into this hobby, I'm more someone who enjoys basic layouts. I'm not really someone who would jump on something that's wine red or, or blue or whatever else. So take that as you will, but a brilliant question though. Christopher Day, thank you so much for the super chat, man. I really appreciate it. Let me just pull up another watch. Uh, the Geo 60s you've looked at, let's pull up the, the blood snow or the, you know, the blood in the snow. Thank you so much for making my weekend of these streams. If possible, take a look at the Orient Star. Okay, I'm going to pull that now. And the SARB 033, great weekend. Thank you so much for the super chat, Chris. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I love this time when we can all just sit and chat. It's almost like you're getting into my brain and we're just chatting about how, uh, let's see, is it R-E-A-U? Oh my goodness, there's so many references. 4B. Here we go. I've seen this piece before. Really interesting use of balance on the dial. There's something about the the way that they, they put a power reserve at the top. Great weekender, I would say. And another thing is a weekender watch can be a guilty pleasure watch, you know? Something that you just put on, wear, throw around that you don't really need to pay attention to. That was one of the underlying themes of the this, the discussion is that it's a watch that you can just wear and have fun with. And I don't know why my magic mouse is having such an issue with trying to get this up. There we go. Cheetown, I missed your super chat. No, I didn't. That is terrible. Apologies. Let's get back up there. You, have I? Yes, I have. Thoughts on the Seiko Presage? Let's have a look. S-A-R-Y-0-5-5. The Seiko ref, just references in general, sometimes. Um, S-A-R-Y-0-5-5. The Seiko Presage line is a family that I really haven't looked at. The Cocktail Time. I think is pretty cool. But there's just something about these pieces that Seiko makes, very much like the Seiko 5 that we looked at earlier. It just feels like a generic Seiko. And, and that's something that, you know, when you initially look at the watch, is there something about it that really pulls you in and keeps you, keeps you engaged? And this, to me, just feels like another Seiko piece in the family. And that's generally why... I am uh, not so for these pieces. I prefer Seikos when their dials are crazy and, and expressive and exciting. So, uh, you know, dials important. And something saying the dial is important. Unfortunately, a lot of watchmakers spend little time on the case, especially the flanks and the polishing and everything else. Case profile gets me, Founder Capital says. It's all, it's all unique to, to your preference. Everything, it's all preferential related. Caliber 3135 says Super Rugby is back. I've been, I've been watching Six Nations. I haven't been seeing any Super Rugby, but I will catch up to it eventually. If anyone's been catching the Six Nations games, I think it was Wales versus Italy and Ireland versus uh, Scotland today. Ish. The teams need a bit more a bit more control, I would say. Ming starting at 1,000 euros. Great for that. Thank you for the highlight. Blood in the Snow sounds like a Scandinavian crime fiction. You have to do um, Okay. In something, my favorite weekend of H. Moser Pioneer. Not too flashy, great. In something has an insane collection by the sounds of things. Let's see, Moser Pioneer. Now, I think Moser is very uh, niche for the most part. It falls in the same realms as, as Ming watches, I would say. There's some great pieces. I love the, this is just the central seconds. Love the dials. You're getting these watches for the dials. This is Moser's top seller in the family, for sure. Love it. Finish is great. Very cool. Great with a bracelet, as you say. That would be nice. Um, geez, we've really gone through a lot of pieces. I love it. Andrew, welcome back to the show. 
Thoughts on the Tudor 1926? We can have a look at that. Thank you, Junior. Um, another great, great weekend watch. RGM watches, Pro Aviator. So as we've been, we've been running the show, can you believe, for an hour, 10 minutes, <laughs> uh, I want to back off on the references. And as I say that, Q Maestro drops in Omega reference, 131, I mean, how is anyone supposed to know? <laughs> and then Ron says, I like the Omega 134. Yeah. It's like someone had a serious problem with the reference numbers. And that's partly why I love... Rolex so much because you can just say 16570 and you've just got it. Bang. Five references done. Six references done. And mm -hmm. instead, you've, you've SBGA, SBGN, it just gets out of control. So let's pull up something. Um, something simple, not too crazy complicated with the name. The Christopher Claret or Claret. I've never heard of this piece before. Let's have a look. Christopher. You know, just when you think you, you've, you've looked into watches, so you get these kinds of references, and it's a X Trem one. My goodness. <laughs> Talk about leisure. I mean, this is just so chill. Reminds me of that Hublot Ferrari edition, but it has a tourbillon inside it, really slick. No, I mean, this is another thing. You know, industrial designer would probably say, that's very cool. But then at the same time, you look at it and say, is it really necessary that it needs to be this complicated? I've seen these pieces before. This is a, a family in itself where these watches have these, these balls that roll up to match the, the hours and the minutes with a tourbillon inside. I mean, if we're talking about complicated stuff, we'd be jumping to watches like, um, what's, that, what's that name? That producer Michael wears so much. Jeez, I don't know. There's so many references out there. It just, it's just nuts. Let's pull up. Uh, I just want to get back to the overseas. I think this is one of the coolest photos. Watch on Insta. One of the coolest photos of this piece out there. But I'm loving this. Um, so it is all down to guilty pleasure. What do you enjoy? What pieces do you like wearing? And again, if you could tag me in the chat at ID Guy, I'll see your comments a lot easier. It's quite difficult to keep up with everyone here. Uh, WJ Watch is saying, what do you think of the Oyster Perpetual 1160036 Blue Explorer Alternative? I know the reference you're talking about. Let's have a look at it. There's a few references. There's also a white dial version that looks great. This is, this is beautiful. It really is. And... It is quite a different watch to the Explorer. Again, in the beginning of the stream, we were chatting about just how West Perpetuals have rounded bezels instead of flat bezels. Wow, that's a really good picture down there. Awesome. This is a Watch You Seek Forum photo. Because it has a rounded bezel, brings the visual presence down ever so slightly. Talk about a sleeper piece. Now, whether or not you want a radiant dial, that's up to you. Um, to each their own. Radiant blue, I think it's great. Uh, it's all up to your opinion. Once again, it's it's really your thought on the piece. There's also a white dial variant that has this aesthetic. And talking about Basel World predictions, people are saying that they'll be bringing out a white dial explorer and everything else. I don't think so. This looks like it has pink inlays inside the dial. That's very peculiar. Okay, the Tudor 1926. Let's get that up. That sounds cool. Don't know what that is. Is this a reissue? Huh. Now, the thing is, with this reference, with any any watch that has this dial layout, I, it immediately loses me. I think this format, where's a good image? This is pretty cool. This format on the dial, I have like less than zero interest in the way that these dials are laid out. Apologies, this magic mouse is not being my friend. Uh, here we go. Try and get something good. I think this, you know, partial sweat on the hand, all of that plays into the fold. The, the divide between the batons and numerals, this is the same layout that the, the, the Seiko Alpinist has. And it's one that really doesn't appeal to me in the slightest. But that's me. I mean, I'm sure this must have been a big styling in the 20s. Uh, this could have been used on some of the first wristwatches, I would imagine, 1926. Um... But that's what takes me away from it immediately. I think a dial format like this, it's just not the greatest in my humble opinion. Ballon Ross instruments are good leisure. Ballon Ross, in general, I find very peculiar. Wow, I'm getting asked about vintage divers like Seiko's. This is cool. 
I want to try and tone down. Oh, Giza's asking me favorite Rolex bracelet. Any day, Jubilee is my favorite by far. And they have their place, actually. I think the Oyster bracelet's cool, but the Jubilee for comfort and for, for that wear, it's actually amazing to consider that the Jubilee is still, it still feels like such a modern bracelet, but really looks quite old school. I mean, what is Tudor thinking? Look at these diamond inlays inside. I just don't know, man. Very peculiar. Okay, so there's a question about Seiko, the, the Willard, the 6105 by uh, Lezorax123. So the Willard was such an important watch to the family. I've, uh, I've mentioned this piece a few times in Seiko videos. I think the first was probably in the SKX. I called it, why is the SKX so loved? And uh, you really, what happened was Seiko took inspiration from the Blanc Pond Bathyscaphe in their first reference, their first ever diver that they introduced in the late 60s, no, mid 60s, I'd say about 63, might be wrong there. But the Willard, this reference was really one that came, it really brought Seiko into their own. This is actually a Prospects edition that they're bringing out. I think it's great. This is really a character to the family and love the size, love the presence, quintessential diver for the Seiko family. And I love the fact that they even replicate the strap to look just like the original Willard. Called the Willard because uh, Captain Willard, Martin Sheen wore this reference in Apocalypse Now alongside Marlon Brando, who wore a 1675 Rolex GMT without a bezel. Talk about watch nerdery, right? Lots of suggestions from Tippy about the H. Moser nature watch. I'm going to puck, he says, Tom Austin. Yeah, it does. It does seem like a hockey puck in the way that the, the, the styling has gone. The 62MAS, 1965. Thank you, Cheetown. I was close. 63, 65, same difference. Um, okay. So there was talk about the numerals, the two, four, eight, ten. It doesn't, yeah, and it's that symmetry. I don't know if I still have the watch on the screen. No, I didn't. I got rid of it. Um, it's that it's that lack of symmetry that I don't really like about it. Maybe that's the element. I don't know. All open to opinion. Um, so let's think. What's another piece? We've been running this now for what 120 minutes almost. Pretty good. What uh, I want to try and bring this back to. Actually, the last half an hour, I'd like to bring it back to our favorite leisure watches, whether or not that's a watch you own or one that you aspire to own. And just bringing up the categories again, let's just pull it up one more time. And I would like some nice suggestions, some suggestion that you really think everyone would like to see on the stream. The 50s Explorer reference uh, used the even Arabic numeral dial akin to the Alpinist. Is that so, Willard? I had no idea about that. I really had no idea about that. <laughs> run the shrink that's funny um so talking about just our final closing for the last half an hour about references that you would like what what you consider a leisure watch um what do you think actually i'd like to know your thoughts oh cheat on the zodiac let's do that what do you think sums up a good leisure watch uh oops this is probably a bad idea that i'm typing this in so zoomed in. Hey, cool. It corrected itself. So I don't know why I haven't gotten around to talking about the Zodiac Seawolf, but geez, they are some amazing watches. I love the these contrasting pieces. Apparently, these are very rare and sought after now. They're limited edition pieces for the most part. Um, but I just love that, that striking gulf color scheme, um, that teal blue and orange. And there's also one with a bright green and blue. I mean, look at that. How stylish. And then, of course, you have this, which is too, I mean, beautiful. I handled a, a 50s Zodiac GMT just like this with a stretch rivet bracelet, and it had a Bakelite bezel insert. And I think Cam Craft and Tailored was selling it for about a 1,000 pounds, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. Found the time capital says, I make it nearly two hours. I'm ready for bed, still jet lag. Yeah, you've been traveling a lot. I'd like to know more about the trip. I mean, it seems like you went from L.A. to, to Miami, I think, the last, last trip, or Florida. Don't know how you manage to cope, really. I learned something interesting about how best to cope with your day-to-day -day life is to find some kind of release, some kind of mechanism that gets you away from thought. And uh, people say meditation is good. People say fitness is very good. Very interesting talk. I was listening to a guy who had a 200-year prison sentence. And you know, when you have a life prison sentence, you really don't know 
Jacob and Co. That's the watch. Thank you for that. Um, you really don't know how to like clear your head. And the little things, I mean, for me especially, to get my head away from just the the sheer intensity of studying and work and writing or whatever else, I tend to exercise, whether that's gym, whether that's running, whatever else, really helps clear the head. I think it's important to have something that you can just completely escape the world with. Okay, lots of, of chats. Producer Michael, where's Jacob and Cove? Yeah, apologies. I uh, drew a blank there. Aquaterra, that's actually so useless. Okay, I, I've, I've actually run this show and haven't even discussed the Aquaterra, the watch that actually is on the cover of this page. That is really bad of me. <laughs> um, let's have a look. The Aquaterra is such an underrated watch. It really is something cool. I love that it doesn't have... You can't tell me that this is the highest resolution. There we go. And it's all pixelated. That's wonderful. Come on, you'll get there. Where's a good image? The Aquaterra really is something unique in the family. Uh, stylish, simple, very modern. Uh, I don't know so much about the size. Maybe the size could be improved in a few places. And then there's a question about the mill sub. I could talk about the mill sub all the time. 5517, that'd be a good reference. Let's chat about this for a while. No, this is not a good example. This is a model without the sword hands. Let's get one up that's good. That's a winner. I think this was Phillips who took these photos. Super high res. Oh, it's just a beautiful watch. It's so cool. Whether or not you like Rolex, I think it's just absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Ceramic, uh, the classic Tudor Ranger, Forbin Classes asks. Now, the Tudor Ranger, you mean the original that uses the... Jeez, oh, I'm in so many of your chats, guys. I will catch up to them all. Just stop chatting for a second while I catch up to these chats at the top. So Forbin asking me about the Tudor Ranger. If I'm not wrong, it uses the same 1016 case. Uh, and I think it really is cool. I like the fact that they came into their own with this piece, uh, especially with the use of that hour hand. It looks beautiful. Really is beautiful. And that symmetry is there. It's great. I don't know so much about the use of the square seconds hand, but they needed to separate themselves away. Beautiful watch. We can talk about that now. Really cool. These are some great pieces. Um, rubber or canvas, bubble crystal, bright color, whimsical. Yeah, I was talking about pieces. H Mosa Nature. Okay. Let's pull this up. Tippy has been asking about it. I'm sorry that I can't get to them quick enough. It's very difficult when there's like six suggestions and uh, you're trying to like divide your attention. Oh, you are kidding me. This is not a real watch, is it? I'm sure I've seen this somewhere. Oh, Moza. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think we've hit rock bottom with this watch. This is This is just... Okay, I'm going to catch up with the rest of what's going on. And uh, talking about the Zodiac, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, Tudor North Flag, nice piece. Okay, I think I'm kind of getting there. I'm kind of keeping up with you all. <laughs> so this is the, the Moza Nature Watch. Now, they've done this in the past. They've made a Frankenstein. This is just hilarious. This looks like real nature going on here we've got some some real rockery plants these you generally find on uh, little rocks rock schemes on mountains and the rest you've got some lawn you've got some herbs i just i just don't get it man what i mean they, they like poking the snake and like really giving the finger to brands and i think for that reason i mean it, it, it starts a conversation right that is so funny thanks for the suggestion tippy that really is hitting rock bottom by far uh, let's see, Tudor North Flag, Mr. Marcus, let's pull that up. So I just want to focus on a few more pieces and then we can call it a stream. I think we've done a great job. The best part is I, uh, I still feel like I can run the show and not collapse into bed, which is good because last week was nuts. I think we went a little bit berserk with the references and everything else. Weed sticks out of my watch. <laughs> so funny. Uh, the Zin 104 U1, very cool. It has leaf hands. You're right. Wristwatch experience. Is that water resistant? That's so funny. So, so funny. Okay, let's pull away from the Vacheron Overseas. Beautiful watch. So these are all pretty good, you know, guilty pleasure watches for a weekend. Uh, let's see. Are Beatles included? Maybe. Yeah, Carpet Beatles. Um, Greta's watch. That is so funny. You guys, I tell you, it's, it's the best thing when you're actually in the chats because you get to just riff and have such a good time. When you're on the... Wow. Thank you, computer. When you're on the fly and you're having to like keep law and order on the page, 
it's very difficult to like come across with some funny lines. That's so funny. Greta's watch. It's probably one of the best comments of the stream tonight. Uh, so good. So that was fun. We've managed to pull up a lot of cool pieces and, um, Okay, I want to stick to these watches. We've got five pieces on the screen here that all have a very similar aesthetic. The joke is they're all tool watches in a sense. They're all sports-related pieces. I don't think the North Flag gets enough focus and appreciation. Uh, even Tudor doesn't credit the watch. It would be nice to see them actually rehash this design and put it into a a more uh, Tudor-esque style case. What's cool about this is it does have that retro styling question is whether or not they went a little bit too far with the piece um and there was a question from from clive on the 5500 explorer i'm going to pull that up that'll be a cool one to look at and c nyland says is paul thorpe pierogi house in disguise i don't think so paul thorpe runs a tight ship hey eh? runs a very good page the thing is it's that it's sticking to rolex all the time that i think is just it gets it gets quite uh boring <laughs> for me especially i can't stick to rolex for too long i like to jump and move around um hanhart was a favor stephen queen forbin great line vc overseas gets your vote it's a really awesome watch will it so just jumping through these references again explorer two or the the tudor ranger two um really looks like something interesting so i call it the ranger two it is technically the ranger two the north flag Great story. If you look at the, the North Greenland expedition and that whole development, really cool. Highly recommend you look at that. Let me jump to the vintage Tudor Ranger, which I think Forbin Colossus asked me about. I love the fact that they used the 1016 case. All they really did was change the handset, incorporate the 12. It's actually a lot neater when you look at the dial. You know, squint your eyes and look at the layout. All it's missing is that triangle at the 12. And it differentiates itself so much from uh, the, the standard Explorer, just with that slight change. It's a beautiful watch. I'd love to see one of these in the flesh. Then the Zin 104, this is a real cult classic. It sits in the same, you know, especially in the YouTube space, primarily because it's really affordable for what you're getting. Excellent entry level into the family uh, of just wristwatches in general. So this is an aviator's piece, but it has a huge water resistance, has a day-date complication, really nice. I uh, love that contrast. And what makes Zin, Zin, I think, is the way that these dials have been arranged with such a, a huge emphasis on the minute tracks. Uh, you can really, you know, the line weight is so important. I've spoken about this a lot in previous videos. I think the Amiga Speedmaster is one of those pieces that really hits the nail on the head. When you're able to squint your eyes and see various details, like the batons, the hands, that's what gets the emphasis at first. You look closer and then you start seeing that the, the, the divide between the line weights really makes the watch so much more visually appealing. It's legible. It's also it's highly visually complicated, but also it's amazing. Really interesting approach. Zen through and through really sums up the watch a lot. The Aquaterra. I need to do another write-up on this. The furthest I've gone is doing a write-up on the, the, what is it, the the greater than 15,000 Gauss Aquaterra. Very unique watch to the family. Um, love that that contrast between the seconds hands and everything. But I think what they're doing is pretty good. They're, this watch is competing with both the Oyster Perpetual family, also the Datejust, and you get day-date variants of this piece. It's amazing. You know, um, love the color contrasts and the finishings and the materials they use. Wow, we've been going through a lot. And this question about the Santos. Santos white dial, it's also a cool watch full. Um, blue dial, rubber strap, yeah, it is really nice. I'd like to get some wear time with this piece. This is another watch that I'm considering as a first luxury watch. For those of you who haven't heard, uh, I'm making 2020 my year to get my first luxury watch. And I'm really, I'm thinking about sticking to Omega, whether that's an Aquaterra, whether it's a Seamaster, whether it's a, well, this is a Seamaster, uh, whether it's a reissue, 57 reissue, Oh, this is beautiful. I love that that finish, dial, the simplicity. But I want it to really be a watch that epitomizes the brand. It's functional. It's great. That's I can wear every day. Um, 38 mil Aquaterra. That would be cool, Phil. But this is great. And Breguet Type 22, Tippy asks, I think it's a little bit a little bit extreme, a little bit heavy duty for what it is. But Type 20 is a little bit more toned down. And Nick says, congrats. I think it's time. You know, it would be nice to, I'm, I am delaying the, the, 
satisfaction until the end of the year. So um, put a lot more thinking into it. I really want it to be a great choice that sums up what's been going on on the page. And, it, you know, what I preach on the page would be nice to get a watch that reflects that. So it should be cool. The thing is, when you're doing this, I mean, I practically make this. This is a near full-time gig for me at this point in time. Um, when you're doing this all day, practically, you just find there's so much to to drag you into a very to a brand. You you always develop some kind of relationship or an attachment with a watch that you're writing about, and there's always something about it that speaks to you, that brings you back, returns you for more. And jumping to the mill sub five one seven seven five one five five one four. Sorry, it's what am I saying? The five five one seven. Sorry. Let's treat yourself to a thirty four mil olive. That would be cool, Phil. Really cool. And the speedy, Eric Bell says, yeah, I don't think I'll go the, the speedy route. I want it to be a bit more unique than that. Um, not that I don't like it, but I just don't think uh, stainless steel or precious metal, if you're asking. I'm probably going to stick with stainless steel. The watch already is going to cost well over five times more than I've ever spent on a watch. <laughs> You'll like the longer later on. Yeah. Ryan, you never know. Uh, I, it's, it's a watch that's still growing on me. Uh, compared to the other sports watches in the family of Hort horology pieces, I think there are better options out there. Lunga for me is dress watch personified. It's simplicity. It's that Saxonian approach. And M Technic, thank you for joining. I saw you said late to the show. Omega Constellation, another watch that I need to talk about is that Globemaster. Um, just before we do that, let me just pull up that. This is beautiful. This stays on the screen. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Omega Constellation, is that just the standard? You see, this is the thing. I'm quite, I don't know too much about the Constellation line. Um, whether or not this falls into the unisex category of Omega's pieces, I don't even know the history of this watch, which I really need to cover. The Globemaster for me, I think the Pipan, I really want to discuss this watch in more detail. It's something that's really pulled my attention. And you know what it is that attracts me to it so much? Let's find the two-tone of the blue dial, if possible, on a blue strap. Oh, this is pretty good. So pie pan in relation to the actual dial looks like a pie pan, very old-school aesthetic. What I love about this watch is the fluting on that bezel. It is so understated, low-key, simple. Um, it's not loud and in your face. It really keeps to that old-school, you know, 50s, 60s aesthetic that I think a brand like Rolex should look into a bit more. Their fluted bezels are much more aggressive and uh, angry. But uh, the constellation is beautiful, really is beautiful. The layout is nice and simple. They aren't cheap. I was actually surprised. And I think it's because of the movement. The movement is very uh, high end for what you're getting. But that balance is nice. The pencil hand is good. So this is going to be getting a write up very soon. I think it deserves it. I'd like to get some hands-on time with a few of them, get a good idea. Beautiful watch. The, the text, the, I mean, Omega does some great stuff. Really is cool. Um, so, to be asking me, what do I think of Breguet's design language? Summed up as usefulness over beauty. They summed it up as usefulness over beauty. Really? Is that what Breguet says? I think the opposite. Um, Breguet, for me, is a brand that really epitomizes the beauty of watchmaking through and through. And let's just talk. I'd actually like to close off the stream looking at some Breguet pieces. There's some amazing stuff that they do. I just, the classic line, you can spend all day. Highly recommended, by the way. Go on to um, Google or wherever else and just browse through these watches because there's just so much variety in this family. Let's find a better resolution picture. Uh, do I want to, uh, not, do I want to look at the simple classic? I want to look at something a bit more complex. This is cool. A bit of a tourbillon. Now, I think Breguet epitomizes the beauty of watchmaking. I wouldn't say utility so much. I mean, what's cool is that just the, the way they've done the coin edging on the case, we know that that resembles uh, the idea that pocket watches back in the day needed to have a good grip to them. And uh, the simple coin edging just made it so much easier to hold. And the fact that they kept that aesthetic through is such a character piece. Uh, the Breguet hands, Breguet numerals, beautiful. And that's, yeah, once again, beauty over utility, I think. Um, interesting, though. Thanks for that great, great line there, Tiffy. And it looks like I've missed a chat from someone saying he's leaving. Uh, Giza, thank you for joining. I'm sure you've left by now. <laughs> thank you for joining. Uh, stainless steel Octo. The 100 meters Wolfson's can now be a great weekend watch in something. Oh, because they just released it in stainless steel. Yeah, I forgot about that. 
the Octo is a watch that still divides me down the middle. I find it a bit too excessive for what it is, but that's just that's just me. Um, I think it's trying to play too much into that Royal Oak Park, but it is unique. But it is a bit too brash and a bit too thick. I mean, in width wise, not uh, not depth, not case depth. Anyway, Black Bay Fifty Eight. Phil says. Black Bay, for me, Tudor in general, I won't be getting a Tudor as a first watch. And it's because I find that I would rather have a brand that resembles itself. You know, uh, and there was a question earlier from Clive mentioning the 550 Explorer dial. Let's have a look at that now. I would much rather get a first luxury watch that resembles the brand. So, for example, a Breguet or an Omega that really looks like what it is trying to be, where I think Tudor... As much as we like them, as much as they're excellent value for money, can't take that away from them. Um, they still resemble vintage Rolex. And I have enough homage styled watches that I don't really need another <laughs> in the set. You know, uh, these are some great suggestions. So this Tourbillon, I'm not so much of a fan of the Tourbillon bridge in this piece, really. It's nice. It's pretty. Uh, the, the enamel finishing, I think the most impactful, this one, oh, absolutely stunning. This is beautiful. I've seen this, if you need to get on Instagram. If you're not on Instagram, highly recommend you do it because you can follow various hashtags. So you type in the hashtag and you can actually, oh, come on, work with me here, mouse. Let's get a better image. If you follow a certain hashtag, you get the watches that you want to see. So you type in Brigade Classique, follow hashtag. All of a sudden you get inundated with these kinds of pieces on people's wrists. This is beautiful. This really, it's so clean and simple and clear. You take the 5517 Marine that we've spoken about. Actually, let's do that right now. And this should be cool. As we're bringing the show to a close, I think this is quite a nice little send off. I'm going to be doing a recording about this piece during the week, next week. How cool is that for a comparison? Uh, let's see how I can get the sizes a little bit more close at hand. <laughs> how cool is that? So there's the Breguet Marine, there's the Breguet Classique. There's your styling similarities and difference. Really awesome. I'm just going to leave that on here while there's more suggestions. I want to um, back off on the watches if we can. We've been searching for pieces now for well over two hours, 15 minutes. But it's cool. There's a question from Tippy saying, I should watch the monochrome watch and reggae video. Understand them better. Thanks, Tippy. I will. Um, there's a few groups. Monochrome was great. I, I really enjoy Watch Advisor because he manages to interview the owners and the CEOs of the companies gets a nice direct discussion going across. Um, Brega with sub seconds is also really nice. And uh, there's, a, there's a special classique that has, it's, it's like a 35 mil classique. It's really nice and clean. It's beautiful. And Brega is their own style, Tippy says. And that's it at the end of the day. When a brand really can can highlight what they do so well and keep it, you know, not not vary away from from what makes them unique. And with Brega, it's all down to, so again, I would say beauty over usefulness for sure. I mean, look at that thing. Um, I made a classic video, I would say a few weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, and tried to pair it, the Brega classic with vintage flintlock pistols and just how they were made back in the day. And this watch really feels like that artisan piece through and through. Reminds me of that time period, 1775, when they were still making stuff in little little workshops in you know various places. It's a cool story. Really enjoy it. Uh, they accidentally made the beautiful, yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, if we had to go back in time to look at these pieces, they were the top of the functional uh, scheme. Think about it. Um, and I began the stream talking about marine chronometers and everything else. They weren't just used by political figures and all the rest. They were also used as just insanely practical instruments just because of how well they functioned and uh, Brega had to introduce all sorts of things i mean we look at the movements and the overcoils and the tourbillons and all the bits and pieces Brega, wants, that's very funny geez on uh, Brega wants me to wear an itchy wig and get shot in a duel absolutely i mean that's that's the thing hey gorgeous they really are cool i'd love to do of all the watch brands you know i would love to get a breguet. It's one of those pieces that you can just say, hey, got one of these. I'm an enthusiast. I'm not just 
someone who's following the train of everyone else getting sports and steel. Actually, speaking of which, <laughs> let's get that Rolex 5500 up that was asked of me a couple of times. Oh, this is a pre oh, This is one of the originals, right, with the rail dials. And you see, that, that's the thing. There's actually so many, so many references within the line. Is this the piece? So the 5500 was the pre-1016. I'd imagine this was one of the first references. There was there were so many within the line. This is cool. I don't know. This is it on a Jubilee. Explorers on a Jubilee, really something cool. It's a beautiful watch. Again, I'll emphasize, even if you don't like the brand Rolex, you cannot get away from this um, being, I mean, it's such a great watch. It's just such a character. It doesn't epitomize the Rolex brand so much, which I think is what makes it so unique. So see, I'm going now. I have plans. Tippy, thank you for joining. All of you guys, I just thank you so much for joining in on the show. I think we've been running for now two hours 20. I think I'm going to cut it and be, no, the Air King, not with the Explorer dial. Okay, let's get that. I'll get that up. Why would they keep the same reference for the two watches? That's strange. Oh, nice. Very nice. This is even older, 1964. So... I mean, this was at a time when they were working on honeycomb dials and all of those finishes. Uh, and this was from Neil and Bob. Thank you for the, for the suggestion on this. Very stunning. What is amazing, have you just, I've just realized this now. Look at the indices on this piece. This looks almost word for word like what you see on the modern Rolex pieces. I don't know what this typeface is. Very deco-esque. But, uh, this looks just like a two, let me actually pull it up. We're coming to a close on the stream, so I might as well just close off with a few pieces, as we do. 214270, check out this. I've just noticed this for the first time. Look at how those numerals are arranged. We've got these little overhangs, uh, very balanced. This looks quite contemporary. I don't, know if it, I don't know if it works anywhere near as well as the 1016 style numerals, but look how similar these are compared to the Air King. That's almost word for word, except for the closed nines and sixes, of course. But the way the overhang is, especially with the three, you notice that there is something very similar there. Interesting. I've learned something. Superb. Jeez. Now, what's great about these shows, what I like is that this engagement allows us all to share our own thoughts and opinions on watches and suggestions make the deal when you're able to and it's called a con they're called Concord indices. Very interesting. I didn't even know that, Eric. Thank you for that. So that's what it's defined as, the, the plane. That's really cool. Concord's also a bird, right? So I dig it. And the, and the, the alpha-styled hands, if that's what you would call them, very characteristic of that time period. And it's amazing how it's faded away. I really like this. An Air King that just uses the handset, and that's all, you know? Really cool. Uh, no, it's awesome. We've really had a good show talking about all sorts of pieces. Neil and Bob saying we're engaged. This is so sudden. <laughs> uh, truth fears, yeah, we've been running through, just call them shark teeth indices, yeah, I would say. I think this element on the Air King with these beautiful, beautiful hands makes something quite unique. But we've had a good show. We've really chatted about a lot of pieces. I think we're coming up to that 25 minute mark over the hour, so almost two and a half hours. And I think what I'll do for the last little bit is I'll leave this up for a second before closing off the screen sharing. Oh, it's a lot of fun, guys. I really enjoy this because it's it's very relaxing for me. I hope you find it relaxing and enjoyable, at least. And it's a time when I can chat to you all, where we can all share our opinions on various things. I get to learn a lot. I hope everyone else gets to learn a lot. And uh, I get to like highlight what's coming uh, coming out in the next few weeks. The Despair King, that's so funny. From Bonnie Scotland, Les, thank you. There's there's so many of you who I don't uh, say hi to in the chats, and that is not by choice. It's very difficult to keep up with everything else. Uh, but, you know, I really appreciate it. You guys are so cool. I love our community. The engagement is always great. Um, the fact that there's no nastiness and vinylness is awesome. Um, now the Aquaterra is something that I'm looking at, just as a pure, simple, everyday wearing watch really does offer a lot of bang per buck for this piece especially because it competes with many other brands and is also very unique to Omega. The only element that 
I don't like about the Aquaterra is that it is just too symmetrical in some areas. This this dial being without something that divides it up makes it difficult to read at a glance at times, I would imagine. Uh, you can't really center your eye very well. But that's just me, you know, all up to personal opinion. Kind of chunky with a coaxial. And that's the thing, Neil. Neil and Bob, um, that's what defines the... The, the enthusiasts away from this piece is that it is a very thick piece because of the movement being used. Yeah, but it's a pleasure. Christopher Day, thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to close off this section so I can just chat to you guys for a little bit more as the stream comes to an end. But this has been cool. Chatted about a lot of things. Next week, we're going to have a nice selection, two videos, JLC sector series um, and Rolex predictions at the end of the week, which should be awesome. And this is just for you guys. I haven't... Uh, I haven't mentioned it to anywhere else. I'm going to keep it very under tabs. I made some renders up and uh, be looking at Submariners, Explorer 2s, GMTs. Should be a lot of fun. And Tudor. Also do some Tudor predictions and you know what I would like to see from Tudor, Basel World 2020. The reality is we might get something amazing or we might get nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. Eric Bell, thank you. Really, really appreciate it. I don't have to torture myself with the Six Nations rugby. I was I was very I was actually very disappointed with Scotland's game, but of course, Eric, uh, the team what they have ten new players and a new coach. Uh, they obviously don't have much symmetry together at the moment, or synergy, I should say. It's difficult, and especially coming off from the World Cup and getting back into the the World Series of Rugby again must be difficult. But um, yeah, thank you all, Selton, Neville, Truthfears, Mezzanine. There's so many of you here, uh, Joseph, Cheetown. Eric, or talent. <laughs> That's it too. Uh, Ryan, I'm sure a lot of you guys have left already. There's, a, there's like 100 of you left in the show. But for all of you joining in, maybe if you haven't been in the message boards, if you've just been listening to the show, it is, it is uh, such a pleasure having you here. I love doing this. I love the fact that we can engage and talk about all things watches for solid two hours, which is amazing. Um, very inspirational for me. Gets me into the game and gives me some fresh ideas on what I would like to talk about in future videos. And so it goes, you know, <laughs> as always, they're watching the other channel. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's me for the evening. Uh, it's now what half past 12 in the UK, wherever you are in the world. I'd like to thank you all for joining. Um, I always appreciate your input and I will see you next week with the next one. As always, keep your eyes on the community posts that I do because I try and uh, highlight the new videos that come through. And anyway, you guys are great. Have a superb weekend and a great start to next week. Let's make February a great month. Cheers, everyone.